Tonight's episode of Colors of the Dark is brought to you by Murder Road by Simone St. James. Are you ready for the scariest read of 2024? Murder Road by Simone St. James. April and Eddie have taken a wrong turn. Lost in the dark, the honeymooners are suddenly transfixed by a ghoulish glow amidst passing trees until a young woman appears from the light as if summoned. Does she need help? Is she a hitchhiker or a threat? But she's alone and stumbling in the dark. They take a chance and offer her a lift. The woman slouches in the back seat and April notices the dark wetness of blood beneath the woman's jacket, slowly dripping and pooling in her seat. And then she speaks, her voice faint. I'm sorry. Two headlights pierce the dark behind them. He's coming. Ingeniously plotted and heart-stoppingly terrifying join April and Eddie on their honeymoon from hell, uncovering the haunting secret of Murder Road, now available in the U.S. and coming soon on the 28th of March to the U.K. Murder Road by Simone St. James, available now at bookstores. Hello and welcome to Colors of the Dark. I'm your co-host Rebecca McKendry, fresh from the five where I have been sitting for two fucking hours. There was a wreck, but also here is Kane who got to spend the day at home, right? Yeah, well, that's a kid. It's not the same. I never enjoy myself when I'm, it's not as fun when I'm, when there's, there's somebody sick. I don't, it's not like having a day off. It's just. Aw, does he have a cold? Get a cold. A couple last couple Aww. days. So my whole week's been upside down, but we have a huge 80s loop back to go into in the second half of the show so we're gonna have to buggy at the top end with some of our picks because we have some really fun stuff on the on the back end some fun guests yeah so let's jump in with one of the ones that we watched together so first up hail mary full of grace we saw immaculate we got to see this at a press screening at one of the really press screening places this is in Beverly Hills where they like won't let you take water in and yeah it's it's real stuffy um but that said we were just excited to get to see this now I have to tell you I was not expecting this movie to be anywhere as near as good as it is well you I would have gone in- anyway that's the difference between me and you I, totally I have would've. my least favorite subgenre besides maybe creepy kids is catholic related films because the best one was made straight out of the gate with the Exorcist. Everything else to me has been like less and less and less. But this year, the fact that there's two and both to me, I would have thought, yeah, not going to be great. And we we're going to go to a press thing. I was like, yeah, it's not going to be great. And then like a day before the South by reviews started to come out, it's like, it's fantastic. I was like, oh shit, we got to go to this. And I think even then we weren't prepared for how damn no, good this was. I was not. So because I have seen, so There are two films coming out this year about pregnant nuns, Immaculate and Omen 2. And then there was one that came out last year, just in latter half of 2023. There was one that I covered on the show called um, Deliver Us from Magnet, also a pregnant nun. And admittedly, after having seen Deliver Us and a lot of like, you know, the St. Maud and things like that, I was expecting Immaculate to be an A24 film about a nun. And so... I went in kind of expecting an A24 film where nothing really happens until the last 10 minutes of the movie and then something crazy happens is legit. I would have described the plot as that beforehand. This is so fucking not that it is shot like an A24 film. It has the, it, it really looks. has the aesthetic of, of like a beautifully shot a24 type vibe but then it's like an exploitation film this is and it's such the biggest exploitation yeah. film and where it goes even in the opening scene like the cold open lets you know that this is not going to be a quiet you know subdued slow burn horror from the start where it's like a girl trying to break out of a convent she's sneaking through a gate and these like sinister looking nuns are chasing her and they break her leg not even break it they break it off and then immediately you're like, well, fuck. Okay, we're in. Well, no, and- especially because, and again, we're forgetting another big one that's come out around the same time, which is the Nun movies, right? And mm-hmm. because of that, it looks just like the Nun at the start of the movie. I was like, oh, it's going to be just the same old thing. Very Nun. Until the leg, and then the leg, and you're like, okay, well, they wouldn't have done that in the Blumhouse in the model. Yep. And suddenly you knew the rules were going to be different, and that was really refreshing. And this gets so goddamn sleazy and just feels like a 70s non-exploitation film where it goes. It just gets so like when they start bringing, I won't say a word about what they bring up, but let me just say some of the plot twists. I was like, oh, that's where we're going. Okay. 
okay, I am so in. And there was literally one of the most grotesque and exploitive moments in the theater. I clapped and cheered um, in the middle of the press screening. I was just, it, it was so much fun. Yeah, um, Sydney Sweeney so. really confirmed, like this is a big year having, you know, transition from TV, but like thinking about this and she has like the number one rom-com of the year and the fact that she has this, and I hope this does really well. It, it's really mm -hmm. somebody solidifying themselves as a star, but also like somebody who apparently does love horror because I started doing a quiz where she was listening to screams, but couldn't see who it was. And she got Laura Palmer and Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me, right? When I heard that, I was like, all right, you're legit let's let's let her do whatever she wants this is such and she produced this movie was a producer mm -hmm. of it and and is one of the reasons it came to the screen her, the director is the guy who directed her in that amazon Michael film Mohan. yeah the amazon mm -hmm. film the voyeurs which i never actually saw but now i kind of want to it's by a friend of ours andrew lobel who we um know from horror trivia who right. when we did the wj horror strike he was the co-organizer with me he was the strike oh, leader along with cool. me that day um it was andrew and so I've known Andrew through horror trivia for years. So when he told me he wrote this, I was like, for me, yeah, um, no, really, like it just, it, it feels like it's such a me movie. So I was just so well, excited. that's, and that's why, I mean, this is why it's exciting. We're both going to give this glowing, like basically one of the films of the year so far. And yet you are in the bag for this, even the not good version of this, you probably still would have enjoyed and I would have hated, hated. And so the fact that I loved it, it means, okay, we're both on the, this is double thumbs up. We are all in the bag for Immaculate. Hopefully it does well this weekend um, because it has also, without any spoilers, it has an all-timer ending. Everyone will be, this is one of those ones that people Cheering. talk about or, it, you know, maybe controversial, but it will certainly last. And that's what great horror films in the 70s did. And it feels like it's cut yeah. from that same mold. So uh, congrats and to the Immaculate team. Yeah, and we just got the press screening invite for Omen 2 today. So yeah, hopefully we'll get that. to see that in the next couple of weeks. And that's interesting because I realized who that's by. It is by, uh, she did a season of Channel Zero and a bunch of the brand new cherry flavor. So, and she has never made a feature. Oh. She's only done TV. Yeah, but, I know who's, I know Yeah, and they're about. really well made and beautifully aesthetic. So it makes sense that that's getting good uh buzz so I'm, I, yeah i'm excited to see that one too i will take two nun films in one year y'all like if you're yeah. gonna hit me with anything maybe next year will be like the year of the aquatic car and all things are coming up becca i'd go there it's a beautiful thing. um okay so i'm gonna move you to the next one um that i watched which is coming out today like the day this episode um releases this should be coming to theaters and that is late night with the devil um, so this already got a lot of buzz because it did a lot of festivals last year. This is coming to theaters the day that this uh, episode airs, and then it's coming to Shutter sometime in April, I believe. This um, is David Dalsmalchian playing a talk show host, a kind of um, Johnny Carson-ish, because mm -hmm. they reference him a lot in it, talk show host from the 1970s, and he has had kind of his own drama. His wife got lung cancer in this very kind of public death um, that happened slowly, and she was on the show a bunch, so the whole world knew that she was dying. Um, and then when she did, he went through this dark depression, the ratings dipped on his show, and he is now back and trying to build the ratings back up as best he can after her death, and he's still very much recovering from it. We are watching the Halloween show and we are actually watching the filming of the show. So it's shot, it, it gets a lot of comparisons and reviews to Ghost Watch. And that's what it feels like where you are watching the show and then sometimes it'll cut away to what's happening behind the scenes as well. So it feels like a camera that is recording this show that is still rolling in between commercial breaks. And so it is their Halloween episode and he has brought on a psychic somebody who claims to be possessed by the devil and a woman who is a doctor who is claiming to um, be able to communicate with the demon inside the girl. And so they, they start the show and immediately things start happening and it slow roll starts getting creepier and creepier and creepier. This was fun. I had a lot of fun with this movie. My favorite part of it by far, and this is a weird thing to say, the performance was great. The script was great. The aesthetic I could have lived in for another four war movies because it is this very they nailed it and the set was beautiful um how the set functioned it truly felt like a 1970s talk show and so they really nailed that getting the audience involved and it gets really trippy at the end which i enjoyed as well so yeah this is heading to shutter eventually but if you can catch it while it's in theaters the directors of this i'd love their prior film 100 bloody acres they're australian i believe yeah, they are. That was and, yeah this was shot in australia so yeah right. that would make sense so yeah um this had like 11 different uh production 
production credit logos up at the top. So it felt like, um, you know, an Australian tax credit That's movie funny. along with a bunch of others. So, yeah. I'm really looking forward to this one. I think it did really well. Maybe won something at South by uh, last year uh, or for or Fantastic Fest. I think it won something. Um, I, uh, hmm, I was a little bummed because that uh, link died by the time I got it. <laughs> I know. They sent me a screening link. And and I was it was like, like ah, but, but uh, that's okay. I'll... Screening links, a lot of the time, they're like 24 hours yeah, yeah. and will self-destruct. And I think we just missed it. Yeah, we time. did. I'll watch it by the next episode, and I'm excited about it. Uh, so another Shutter one that hasn't got as much uh, press at the moment uh, is called You'll Never Find Me. It comes out today as well. Um, I just got the screening link for that. Yeah, uh, also Australian. Uh, directors Josiah Allen and Indiana Bell. I think it's the first feature they've done some shorts together. And the first half, especially, incredibly tense. It's basically an older guy in a um, very kind of isolated dude living in a mobile home in a caravan park, I believe, in Australia. Um, there's a really bad thunderstorm and a young girl, and he's probably, you know, late 50s, uh, and a young girl, probably under 20 or just around there, comes soaked to the door and asks if she can come in. And he's already hearing weird noises around his house and looks not completely with it. And she comes in and he lets her in. And the, then for the next like 45 minutes, it's really a, why is she here? Who is he? Is something bad about to happen? And you're really pretty much on the edge of your seat the whole time. It's just two people talking. Why can't they go to the phone? Can I borrow your, some clothes? Why don't you take a shower? All of these kinds of things. And it's just, it's really burning with atmosphere. Uh, the whole movie is, and it has probably one of the best sound designs of anything I've seen lately, where that's a big part of the story and kind of the off-screen space keeps you on your edge of your toes the whole time because you're you're really in the space the entire movie outside of a couple flashbacks and i don't want to say where it goes at all uh, i where it went maybe at a certain point i was a little less excited and a little more obvious to in some ways but it's still always had me interested i was never out of the movie but the setup is particularly strong and it really just keeps ratcheting up this tension so again a great example of what you can do with two people in one space and make a really tense atmospheric film out of it. Um, so that one is you'll, I don't want to spoil any of, of what's happening because it's kind of, it has so little to work with because it's a, a two people. Uh, so that is, you'll never find me on the shutter. Okay. I'm heading over to Tubi now for a brand new film release to Tubi. And this one's directed by Henry Darrow McComas, who I know from the Monster Squad documentary. Um, and I had seen a couple of our friends posting about this title. Josh Miller had texted me and been like, hey, new RV horror. And so I was like, okay, you know what? New RV horror, I am totally in. Um, and this is called Camp Host. And I will sit quickly correct, not RV horror, van life horror. Hmm. And van life is drastically different from RV horrors. RV people and van life people tend not to mix because those vans, anytime you see one of those like fancy sprinter vans, those things cost like $150,000. Oh. And it's always, you you just bought a house. And it's like, so RV people tend to be kind of like, I don't know about that. Like, it's weird when you go to campsites, like they're, they're oddly um, bifurcated. But I'm that an Airstream said, guy who can't afford an Airstream, but one day, Airstream. like so that's, that's my number one. one dream in my life. When you see oh, the Airstreams, like everybody's like, what the hell? Like that is- They, co they cost a lot. The ones from the 70s. Oh, so pricey. Yeah. yeah, those are so pricey. Um, So as I, as I just discovered a heavy amount of leakage in my gently used C-Class trailer, which we nicknamed Classy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I again, it's 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 what I love. Um, but anyway, so I love this because what this film really nailed was the actual campsite itself. So I love the setup that it is two people who are doing, you know, the van life. They're sprinting around the country in a van, um, one of these really, really nice sprinter vans. And they get to this campsite for the night and they meet this seemingly really nice um, kind of hippie-ish camp host who is the person who brings you into the camp and gives you these rules. And this part felt really real because when you're driving around the country doing camping or RVing, a lot of the campsites that you'll stay at, they're very small. They're run by like, you know, this couple and they'll bring you in. Sometimes they'll offer you dinner and it's part of the charm of why I love camping. And then you usually will sit around with the other campers a lot of the time, or you'll get to know the people around you. And then, you know, you'll sit around and where are you from? Where are you from? So it is kind of this communal experience a lot of the time. If you've seen Nomadland, that is not exactly far from the truth either. 
So yeah, so this is definitely exploring that. So it is this couple that rolls into this campsite and they immediately meet the camp host and she's going over rules, which honestly aren't that unusual for a campsite. Like don't take your dog off the leash. Don't let them roam around. No loud sounds after 10 o'clock. Um, don't leave your trash everywhere. And she's going over the rules and you get right there that she's a little eccentric, just a little off. Like she's not really, you know, it, there's just something slightly off about her. <clears throat> and all the campers meet each other and they begin to talk. Where are you from? All this stuff, talking about the camp host, what they know about her background and everything. And you quickly realize that anytime somebody breaks one of those very um, kind of basic rules that they will die. <laughs> and so if you let your dog off the leash, grounds for killing. So it's standard slasher stuff like Friday the 13th, whereas instead of having sex or smoking up, you're breaking rules at this campground. So it functions as a really fun slasher. I had a lot of fun with this movie, possibly because I agreed with all these rules. You should <laughs> never let your dog off the fucking leash at a campsite that is so goddamn rude and shut your mouth after 10 o'clock. I have kids pick up your fucking trash. I would have totally survived this movie. And so I had a lot of fun with it. This is Camp Host, now released to Tubi, um, directed by Henry Darrow McComas. Well, I have never watched a Tubi original until now. So I'm going to pair it with your Tubi original. This is the first time I watched one and I only watched all... You was All Eyes not a Tubi original? No, it was just an indie film that was sold to just Tubi. Just an indie that was yeah, put there? Like, okay. Like sold to, I mean, it probably shows up now as a Tubi original. But the only one that I, at least as far as I'm aware, the only one I've ever watched, uh, I started it because a friend of ours, Dave Parker, directed it. And I finished it yes. because it was so fucking well made. Uh, he really did a fantastic job just making a movie like this. Like, this is one I just, I, as you know, my t- I probably wouldn't have watched it otherwise. Uh, it's called You Shouldn't Have Let Me In. It just hit. I watched it this morning on my, because uh, I wasn't able to go to work. Uh, and it's really f- interesting. So it's, a, there's a bachelorette party that a couple, uh, a, a, you know, a young woman there gave a friend, best friend, or like traveling in a, you know, in, in a train at the start. They're headed to, uh, already uh, obviously arrived in Italy. They're heading somewhere to see some estranged friend of hers who end up stealing, I think, her boyfriend. And you're just watching the setup feels to me like those kind of the kind of things that I'd never watched, like the Lifetime movies about Christmas or the Lifetime, like that kind of vibe, but well written and quite modern and quite funny and more charming than I was expecting as it was going. And then they get there and then you're kind of with, you know, with these all these characters, of uh, you know, everything's through pretty modern lens. But they end up at this uh, kind of Airbnb that they've rented for this bachelorette and this group of very char- charismatic guy and his uh, minions who, you know, we as viewers obviously know straight away as a vampire. Uh, they have to be invited in because it's an Airbnb, even though he owns the building, they technically have rented it. So they have to invite him in. He's trying to make a wife out of the, our lead protagonist, who I thought was actually excellent. Diana Gardner was her name. Mm-hmm. I, like really a, just somebody interesting on screen hadn't been in too many things and what i liked about the movie from here is it it's like the start is is good and the the writing has to carry it a bit but once it gets into the horror elements and the vampire world and the sex it it very much i kind of pegged it as vampire diary meets subspecies or but with a hint of that 90s erotic thriller vibes and that's why what i started to really like about it was the 90s erotic thriller vibe that it kind of carried through it feels a little dangerous and stuff there was a sequence where they first meet on a dance floor that i actually thought like just on a filmmaking level was one of the better things i've seen this year and it wasn't a movie i wasn't expecting to see that just the introduction of the bad guy was done very you know it's just done like a big set piece so super fun um and it's just like again it's not the kind of movie i I know we're biased because it's a friend but i i can tell you if there are movies that would show up like that where i might watch 20 minutes and be like oh cool i got an idea of what they did congratulations but it's not for me whereas this never was i actually out of this movie and i uh, really enjoyed it and kind of made me think oh i I hope he gets some bigger budgets to play with after this because it really it was so slickly made you know uh so hopefully people do it the production design, and I know that they they shot it um, overseas in a very luxurious place. It's all Italy. Yeah, yeah, like it's in the Italy. castle, everything is so beautiful. But even the way that he was filming it, like it feels so decadent. I just deeply, um, it was beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it watch. just it was just fun. You sometimes see these ones where you go, oh, this person did everything they could with the material. Kind of like in the eighties where people got job for hire and. You see that they leave it all versus just it's a job. It's like, no, it's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. I felt that watching this. And so uh, congrats on that. And it got me through my first to be. I might, before you go into your next one, just because it pairs too well, let me just give you a quick explanation because I did see another vampire film 
uh, by somebody who whose directing is not quite as strong as Dave Parker's, and that but but his singing is much better than Dave Parker's, and that is Glenn Danzig. Um, I, you watched the Glenn Danzig yes, movie, the new one, Holy the new one that shit. isn't out. So this is I was going to say this is like hard to find. It, it right doesn't now, exist right? anywhere. The person who I had to watch it from, he had to go to the one, like they had some one-off screenings where Danzig sold a $40 DVD of it. And that's how I was able to watch this. Um, $40, the sky will never go back. But that's it. I, I don't want to completely shit on it because it's it's like interesting. I actually think incrementally, and I mean incrementally, I don't mean big swings, Danzig's getting better. Like it's kind of, it feels directly like a direct sequel to Carpenter's Vampires, but then you take out the sound. It has like no soundtrack and it it feels kind of weird because it's just missing that element to it. Uh, but it opens with like, there's a topless, very busty blonde woman on the back of a horse being held against her will going through on a credit scene that is longer than 90%, longer than Scorsese's last movie. This credit sequence is so long. It's just like them going through the desert for like five minutes as she's topless. And Devon Sawa, which is one of the, definitely elements that he upped is like there's real actors in this for for the most part and Devin Sawa being the lead is a big deal and he's really good at it. it's kind of a man with no name all in black he's riding through the desert comes across like Danny Trejo who's a, a vampire and he, he's running across different people he's trying to get the sanctuary place where the only way you can get access to it's a vampire sanctuary is to give them a virgin uh so they can feast on her so that's why he's brought her through here he comes in here and clearly it's pretty clear to us that he's looking for revenge on somebody and you don't know who uh and he gets in there and, and it's still got these very, very you know danzig sh- shot it he's the dp uh this sh- wow. has five thousand zoom shots and that's i was counting with a counter five thousand zoom shots zoom shots within zoom you had shot. a clicker right there but i'm not joking when i say it will zoom in like at a random point not no purpose to it and then it'll kind of zoom back out and then it'll zoom back in again and it's weird that you somehow work in the long run like they they feel amateur for sure but there's like a certain point where you pass and you're kind of like i don't know glenn's just he knows what he wants to see right now <laughs> it just there are some very cheesy sex scenes and like very you know his typical kind of eroticism a lot of stuff in it that is just utterly mediocre but but for the most part a lot of the acting stuff's interesting um but he's trying to get like the guy who killed his sister and what was interesting and one of the reasons i knew i wanted to watch it outside of just being you know curious was that one of the last shows I recall us doing in the you know latter shows of uh, before the pandemic of Shockwaves was when Julian Sands came on and the thing he had just come from was this movie and I and so it's mm-hmm. a while ago but yeah he was like he had a really good experience he really enjoyed it he's actually quite good in it but what's fucking hilarious because you know what Ju- we all know Julian Sands hair you know we've seen him in so many movies like thin blonde hair in this he's wearing like the danzig hairpiece this big black crazy hairpiece and it's just bonkers like watching him dress like that is so weird he's good in it he's like playing a serious villain he's the main guy like he he doesn't break he's never being tongue-in-cheek um here's the interesting thing and this is the part and eli roth has a a pretty big cameo in there as a vampire aren't the soskas in it soskas are like uh victims actually like they come in and get uh, like bit in like it just it's more of a movie than the, the last one was like multiple stories and i just never got into any of them to be honest this one you definitely couldn't call it good uh, garo edit is the editor with I, okay so i was gonna say if you want me to blow your mind our friend garo no i, I guess oh i saw it in the credits he was editing with dancing though so who knows how much control i can't imagine being in an editor but but um here's the thing that'll kind of blow you maybe not surprise you but like was a bit of a revelation for me is I'm watching this movie and I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. Half in, half out of it, to be honest, because it's just, it's lacking some other element. And then Danzig enters and he's not really in the other movie. Then Danzig comes in and he's kind of playing the, I would call him the Bill Paxton of, uh, he's like the Severin. He comes in with blood on his face. He looks like he's wearing like a Confederate uniform. He, he's fucking like, you do not want to take your eyes off him. Like he is so charismatic. that wow. it made me go, I think this is where he's gone wrong by directing these. Maybe he should direct them. I think he needs to be the lead in one. And I'm not saying it as a joke. Like I literally was sitting there going, wow, you're so much more interesting than almost everyone in the, your movie. And I would just want to watch you. And and we all know he's an incredible performer as a singer and just, you know, uh, the most an incredible career. But you're like, I think the joke of it, like a lot of people joke about it. Some people genuinely love his stuff like this. But I, I was watching it just going, man, I think you've got a real. Cr-. And, and back in the day, this is something some people will remember back in the message board days when the very first X-Men movie was being made. There was a a pretty big groundswell, and this is a long time ago, a groundswell for Danzig to be cast as Wolverine 
Yep, that was massive. And it was because that was like... of his height, because he's short, and yep. Wolverine is it, meant to be in the comic books. He's very short compared to what then becomes what we know of. And I remember it really well. I mean, there was Michael Ironside was thrown around back in the day, uh, but I remember the Danzig comments. And now I look at it and I go, you know what? I think he probably could have been a big, big star of the screen in the same way that somebody like um, Vin Diesel is, you know, like he might've mm-hmm. had a career in that way. And maybe he still could, but I, I, I don't know. It's, I thought it was worth watching just for his presence. And I wish he was in a lot more of it. And now I kind of want the big Danzig. Like I want him to go Clint Eastwood and just make himself the star of all his movies uh, and get somebody else to be the cinematographer. That would be my notes, Glenn, if you're listening, <laughs> but that is called I Death gotta, Rider and the House of Vampires. I got to tell you that after Veronica, I had no intention of watching this movie and you have changed my it's mind. A little bit, to me, it's just a little bit better, but it's also way more like it's way more in the wheelhouse of you know what it is, right? So you can watch it just because you know what it is. It's a vampire Western. So it's it, whereas the other one was kind of like, oh, you had to watch shorts and, you know, it's just never really cohesed in the, the right way. But uh, I love the idea of Danzig becoming kind of like a John Waters of horror, if that is a thing where like Eli Roth is in his movies and, you know, Devin Sawa stars in them. Like, you know, talent in it, this one. It, yeah. Yeah, that it is going to be kind of campy and weird and, you know, some parts are clunkier than others, but that it does have this, you know, level of appreciation from Hollywood wanting to participate. It, it, I like we'll that. have to ask Garrow at Trivia on Friday because I'm yeah. curious why this isn't available yet maybe there's still something they're waiting to do or maybe he's only selling it It just seems like something that would make sense to have been put out by now so Mm -hmm. we'll keep people uh a lot i did get many texts from my friend star when he saw that i watched and he was outraged that i hadn't called him because apparently he's a huge fan and wanted to see this i was surprised to learn this i did not know this about him calling him out on air so (laughs) okay did you watch it oh i didn't I didn't. I you totally, didn't. I you totally, for, oh. I actually just forgot about it because you just mentioned it in the next part of the interview uh, that we're, we will be revealing in a moment. And I was like, oh, I forgot to watch it. So you sell me on it now. Hit me. Okay. So when I was on the musical theater or musical horror draft um, on screen drafts a couple of weeks ago, BJ Colangelo was like, okay, um, horror musicals are on their way back because of has been hotel. And I was like, wait, what What's has been hotel and has been hotel. It's an a 24, very, very adult cartoon horror musical currently on Amazon prime. Mm-hmm. And it's based off a YouTube. She, um, the creator, um, put the first episode that she had created back in 2019. Her name's Vivian Medrano, popped it up on YouTube. And it got so much success with that one little pilot episode on YouTube that it ended up getting picked up by A24 and Bento Box. And they turned it into this eight episode first season run on Amazon Prime. And this has exploded. Like as soon as you pull it up, all this fan art, the wiki, the fan lore, all it's like got this massive cult following behind it. And it is very, very adult. And here's where it gets weird for me is I, as soon as BJ said that, I was like, oh, I want to watch this. Log into my Amazon Prime and I've already watched all eight. And immediately I'm like, who in the house watched this? Marnie. And then I have to holler for my 11 year old. And I'm like, did you watch this? And she's like, yeah, mom, all the kids at school love this. This is like huge. You can buy the shirts at Hot Topic right now. Everybody loves this. And I mean, literally the second character in this is a porn star, um, the like second lead character. And um, so I, I I had to look at her. Do you have any questions about anything? And she's like, no, I'm good. It's just a fun show. And I'm, okay, you can't watch this again. Like it is very adult. Um, so yeah, but it is very fun. The concept is it's Lucifer's daughter. It's set in hell and Lucifer's daughter. Hell is become overcrowded with people. And the way that it's currently being combated is that to battle the overcrowding once a year, all of the angels will come down from heaven and do what they call an extermination. And they will literally slaughter people from hell. And that is their current means of controlling the population in hell. But Lucifer's daughter comes up with the idea of opening this hotel that is focused on redeeming souls so that they can ascend to heaven. And she's trying to negotiate a deal with heaven to do this. But the angels send down Adam from like Adam and Eve to negotiate. And he's a real dick. Like he's awful. And he actually refers to himself as I'm the original dick. And he is. <laughs> um, so yeah. And then, so it becomes her 
battling the angels and preparing for the next extermination. So it literally been, and her kind of leading the entire hell army behind her, but hell is not like some poetic place with like demons and pitchforks. And yes, we're united. It is a horrible place where everybody's eating everybody and everybody is like, you know, uh, shooting people and stabbing them. And it's just awful anarchy of horror. Um, so yeah, it, this is an amazing, amazing show. It's basically, she is a Disney princess character and she is singing songs from a Disney princess perspective. And if you just follow her character arc, it is that of a Disney princess, how she's going through inner battles and, you know, fighting with her dad and the legacy that came before her, but she's leading the troops and everything. But it is set in this extremely gross, like Cronenberg-esque world where everything is awful and horror galore. I loved this so much. It's already been renewed for a second season. Um, and the best thing is that even though these demons are all awful people and shooting each other, they're far more compassionate than the angels. And so, yeah, I just found this to be so wonderful. And you have to watch the first episode. I at least sent you the trailer. You got to watch the trailer. Yeah, no, I'll watch the first you watch, one before. You're going to be in yeah. as soon as you see it. And like the fact that it is a musical, don't let that stop you because this is so adult horror as well um in the amount of gore and just depravity that it brings onto the screen it's it's hilarious okay no I, i'm curious i totally uh, dropped the ball on that one uh, now and here's the amazing thing with this it feels like we were covering friends projects tonight this was actually coincidental paula hayfley's the producer oh, of it cool also yeah also yeah. someone who would be at trivia yeah from trivia um the last I'm going to mention isn't horror, so I'll just do a brief one, but it's uh, a perfect kind of cult slash gateway kids and adults. I got to go to a uh, preview screening, but it comes out this Friday in theaters for a push. This is from Yellow Veil, and it's a big deal push for them because this film was shot on 16 millimeter and has a real throwback. And it kind of perfectly has fits the vibe of the rest of the show we're going to be talking about today, which is an 80s vibe. I would say this is if Wes Anderson's first film was to make his version of The Goonies, uh, or Taika Waititi doing Turbo Kid, that that would be this movie. It's called Riddle of Fire, and it's by someone called Weston Razuli. It's, uh, like I said, it's all shot on 16, and has this, it's kind of fascinating, really funny. It's like almost born a cult movie, and I know that's not a thing, because you need time, but it definitely, it's either going to be a massive breakthrough for this director, and they're going to make, you know, movies like Taika Waititi, or it's just going to be this, like, big fringe cult thing. But uh, it's these three young kids who are getting into trouble on their motor scooters, wearing balaclavas, you know, doing, like, stealing Xboxes and stuff, and looking after their one mom who is completely sick on, on flu medicine so they can get away with whatever. It's two brothers, an older brother and a younger one, who, but, but all under, like, 13 or 12, and uh, their fr uh, female friend from, like, down the street, who's 12 as well. And they're getting into these crazy adventures, very much like the Goonies. They end up getting they have to go embark on a very simple thing to unlock the video game password that they want to play uh, that their mom won't give them. They have to go on an errand to try to get a blueberry pie for her. And to do that, they need, they want to bake a pie. They have to get an, a speckled egg and it leads them to this big kind of almost fairy tale goonies. They end up mixed up with bad people with guns and in in like almost a fairy tale in the forest and ends up with like crazy violence and like, but it's really quirky, really funny. It's a big swing and it's going to be some like, like, you know, Brian from Pure Cinema, I, like he hasn't seen this yet, but if I was guessing, I would th think this would be a him movie, like he would love it. I don't know, think I was the, necessarily the right audience, but I was totally charmed by the end of it. And the, the adult audience seemed very like laughing all the way through. One of the kids is like, you know, six. And every time he says something like, you know, like those bastards are saying people are just laughing because it's so it's kind of absurd. But I, I think this could be a real fun one for some of our listeners probably to as soon as it comes out to like watch with kids and probably get a real kick because it has got that feeling of a Goonies adventure. So I, I, I just saw it and I was like, I still want to give this a plug, even though it's not hard, because I think some people who listen to this will really dig it. It's called Riddle of Fire. Definitely theaters first. Okay. I'm going to round this out with two quick book plugs, one that's going to be a little bit longer than the other. First one I'm going to mention um, is Looking Glass Sound from Catriona Ward. This came out last 
August and it took me this long to circle back to it. It's a long book. So I had to like wait for a stretch for me to dive in. Um, it is about a boy who is celebrating his um, summers. He's spending his summer in a family cottage on the main coast in this area called Whistler Bay while a serial killer is kind of plaguing the town called the Dagger Man. And he meets these friends and it's about his summer with his friends, but it's also about the kind of serial killer that's happening in the background that's killing people that is picking people off throughout the town and leaving weird photos around the town and kind of the, the whole dagger man is happening in the background of the story and it gets horror at that point but then it fast forwards to his adult years as he is trying to write a memoir about that summer being a kid in Maine and the dagger man murders that were taking place on the island and that's where it starts getting really, really good. Because at that point, it really starts shifting reality and gets really trippy um, into what's real, what's not, where uh, kind of, you know, uh, blurring lines between memory, reality, and him kind of losing it. And it gets kind of secret windowy or even kind of in the mouth of madness where it's like the writer slowly losing it and becoming unhinged and becoming really engaged um, with what they're writing. The story of just the dagger man and him being there in town itself is really captivating. But when it gets into kind of him looking back at it and what was real and what was not, it's awesome. So this is Looking Glass Sound um, from Catriona Ward. She's got a bunch of horror novels that I've read before. So this was, um, I think she did House on Needless Street. The one I read last year, end of last year, was called Sundial, I think. Yep. And I picked that yep, one up random. It. I've never heard of her or that book. I just picked it up at an airport. It was really good. Great cover. That's why. You you would like this one because this one is so kind of cerebral um, into kind of the writing mm. and, you know, different selves and it, it gets way trippy. Yeah, um, I still haven't seen Secret Window. It's one that, I, really? yeah, it's one of those ones that you've recommended somebody else has read. It's, I like that yeah, one. I gotta watch that one. That's just one of the few King yeah. adaptations I still haven't seen. Yeah, it doesn't get a lot of love, but I like that one. Um, The other one that I want to mention, which coincidentally, and this was a coincidence, was also our ad on the show this week. So it mm -hmm. times out great. Um, Murder Road by Simone St. James just came out um this week. And I had started reading this earlier this month and just finished yesterday. Mm -hmm. I am a huge Simone St. James fan. Um, have read her prior two books um, that I love the most were Broken Girls and um, Sundown Motel were both absolutely amazing. Um, Kind of bridges this gap a lot of the time between kind of thriller crime thrillers and horror and really mixes them together um with a lot of style broken girls was more traditional ghost story but yeah i've always loved her writing the setup of this one is that it's the 90s and there's this young couple april and eddie who are on their honeymoon and they're driving through this town trying to get up to this um they're they live in ann arbor and they're going north to kind of drive up to this one town where they're going to spend time on this lake um one of the great lakes and on the way, they end up on this road and they have no memory of how they end up on this rural road. They just kind of appear on this rural road. And so they are driving along and they end up seeing a girl who is covered head to toe in blood and looks terrified and not knowing what to do. They stop. They pick her up and they drive her to a hospital. And then she dies at the hospital. They get caught up in this crime of this girl of being kind of accused of what's happened to her. And they have no clue. They were literally just driving along and saw her. But it gets into this massive story of a killer that they think is kind of picking off girls along this road. But then it gets even more involved into kind of a supernatural side of it, into a supernatural killer. This was cool. This was honestly, this is probably going to be one of my top books of 2024 um again love simone st james but this is by far my favorite book she has done so far i just loved the world that it built with the small town how it explored the ghosts even how kind of the supernatural side function was just really cool so anyways thank you so much we're going to take a brief break and then we will be back ready to dive into the 80s with our guests heather wixon and patrick bromley <laughs> Okay, welcome back. We are going back to the 80s, a favorite time period for all of us, uh, to discuss a brand new coffee table book called In Search of Darkness, based on the documentary series. Joining us are two people we've always wanted to have on the show, but especially together. This is a lot of uh, horror film BFFs in the same room. Heather yeah, Wilson it is. <laughs> and Patrick Bromley, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. 
Hey, thank Thank you you so much for having us. Hey, congrats. Uh, This is, this is a really interesting book because I, I I didn't know this was happening for a long time. I I didn't hear backdoor channels or anything, but obviously this is based on the three part documentary series that was long running. At what point did this become a book and how early in the, you know, development were you guys brought in? Yeah, so it kind of all started uh, on my side of things where I produced the first in Search of Darkness, uh, was fortunate enough to be like part of all three of them. And when I was working on the first one, there was talk about doing a book then and they were like, oh, would you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, of course. And weirdly enough, my approach was totally different. Um, I'm so glad we went this route because what I had in mind would have been impossible. Um, So this really kind of came around again sort of towards at the end of In Search of Darkness Part 2. It had just hit Shudder, and it was right as I was hooking up with my, not hooking up, that sounds terrible, (laughs) as I was connecting with my publisher for the Monsters Makeup and Effects series, and he was like, hey, you worked on In Search of Darkness, right? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, have they ever talked about doing a book? And I was like, actually, they have. So I kind of brought everybody together, and then they made their little deal agreement, whatever, And then came to me and they were like, oh, would you want to write this? And I was like, okay, sure. And at that point, it's one thing I want to make sure people know. It's like, this is actually covering the movies from Doc 1 and Doc 2. um, Because this kind of started happening before Doc 3 was even like in production. So um, so there's like 142 different movies from those two documentaries. And basically, so they, they were like, okay, let's dive in. And then we're kind of going through everything, setting the format, figuring out the the bells and whistles. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't write this book by myself. (laughs) I was like, this is insanity. Um, Because one, I mean, it's just it's nice to have different perspectives. Um, But two, I doing what what I did, like I think which was like 70 movies because Patrick did two extra um, was like so stressful. I feel like I still have PTSD a little bit. (laughs) Um, I was going to ask about burnout, 80s burnout for sure. Right. You know, I'm I'm coming through it. And but so when they were like, well, who would you want to write with, uh, you know, be with you to write this book? And I was like, there's only one person I want to do this with. And it's Patrick. Um, just because I was even before we were connected as friends, I found his writing. It was right when I was starting to write. He'd already been writing. Um, and I just knew there'd be a really good balance between us in terms of what like our strengths are when it comes to 80s horror and I don't know for you Patrick when you came into this did you think this was going to be what it turned out to be pure stress for like 13 14 months <laughs> yeah <laughs> I kind of did but I was ready for that that's what I signed on for how did you so, uh, Sorry. yeah that was actually my question you beat me to it Kane how did you two meet I'm always so um interested in like because the horror community I mean we're global but then it's immediately like oh of course I know Aunt Tibbs that like it's just these like you know like there's no boundary because of the internet so how did you two meet and start working together to begin with um well we actually met when I was in fifth grade and Patrick was in sixth grade Mm. Um, wow. Yes. Okay. It was yeah. not, I was expecting like, oh yeah, we were on the press junket for Sinister 2 and <laughs> I was not expecting that. Okay. Do you go yeah. on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically how, how it worked out is like my best friend was a year older than me. So she went off to junior high before I did. And all of my friends knew I was like obsessed with horror. I made them watch so many different things that they probably didn't even really want to watch. Um, and she came home from school one day and she's like, oh my God, she's like, I just met this kid who kept talking about Freddy Krueger. She's like, you need to talk to him. And I was like, okay. And so she gave me, she had Patrick's number. So I just called this random kid up and I was just like, hi, I think you like Freddy Krueger or whatever. And that was kind of how it started. Um, There's a really good poster story in there. If you want to tell that Patrick, but like, yeah, we just kind of, we did junior high together. I moved away for high school. And then it was like, I actually came across you or I don't know if you came across me Either way, like we cross paths on MySpace of all places because we're old. Um, and I just that there's a little also, older than me, just so you guys know. It's I will I will thing. get on a plane right now, Patrick. I I swear to God. Um, yeah, and so basically we just kind of cross paths again. And then once I started to get into my groove with Daily Dead, and I could bring people in to do writing and stuff, I was like, oh my God, Patrick, you know, is awesome. We should bring him in. And he was a crucial part of like when we launched our podcast too. So he came up with the stay scary guys. Oh, so uh, Patrick tells the true story of how you guys met. 
Uh, it was the sinister two press junkie. Where's the drugs, wasn't it? Where's the drugs and sex and weirdness? Too. You know. <laughs> no, because well, I, yeah. I I'll tell my story of how I first met Heather um, after this, but it was at a press junket. So yeah, yes, for, for sinister two. No, it was long before that world. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. No, how did you actually? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Patrick. Oh no, that is the true story. Oh, of that, is the that is that okay. is. We met. Are I used sure? to. Was any additions? My, no, I used to sit. Uh, I would take my mom's cordless phone and sit in her closet in the dark and talk to Heather about Freddy Krueger when I was in sixth grade. That's pretty. No, cool. I think um, one of my very first pet junk, press junkets when Fangoria transferred me out here in 2012. Um, one of the very first press junkets that they sent me on, and I knew no one in LA at that time, no one except for my allergist. That was about it. And um, the Fangoria sent me to a press junket for a movie that barely had a release at the time. It was like the flight's number. It was like fourteen oh nine or something. Seventy five hundred. Like Boom. And that was the very. <laughs> so they sent me on the press junket here for that. And on that press junket, I met. Elise Wax and Heather Wixon. I think Heidi, Heidi Martin Nunez may have been on that press junket as well. And um, I remember all of us and we were sitting together and we were kind of like introducing ourselves and it was kind of like my first friends in LA. And it was actually really cool because they they let us go on the plane and they showed us how the hydraulics worked and how they created turbulence and things like that. Um, and again, the film had barely a release a number of years later, but it was how I met a lot of the people I still hang out with in LA. I, I met you that way. Do you know which movie, Becca? That's where we met for the very first time. Was on a press junket. Devil's Carnival. Devil's Carnival. We're in the middle. We're yeah. at the actual. We're Devil's in the Carnival. middle of a field yeah, in weird. like methy territory. That's all I remember yeah. is like driving out there. I was like, this feels really sketch, guys. It, it but then cool, suddenly though. we were on a film set. Yeah, it was really. They had cool. lots of. It was like an actual like carnival, a place where it's always like that. So I'm curious to see what they are like. It times. was. It was a circus storage house where the circuses like store mm. their stuff out of season. Yeah. Am I right on that? Yeah, because we actually went there, too, and I think on a different night. We did the special features, too, for Devil's Carnival. Oh, cool. oh. Um, yeah, but that was actually, there's, like, they were on some TLC show where they, like, they're, they, lo like, loan out, like, carnival stuff to, like, different places on the West Coast and things like that. They used to do it across country, but I think they've changed a little bit. Um, but, yeah, did you guys get to meet, like, um, Ivan Moody was the, probably there? I and think so, yeah. I'm, I... Clown from Slipknot. I met Clown, yeah. Yeah. That was very, that was such a cool question. Okay, so anyway, yeah, set visit. That was a set <laughs> visit. Um, anyway, back to the book. So I want to, um, before we dive into kind of like the five films that made us in the 1980s, I want to kind of ask like, how um, were you watching films in the 1980s? Like I was such a video store brat and my parents did not give two fucks what I rented. So I did. Um, but I know Elric was slightly different because he was scared. Um, so like, what were what your the, kind where of- Where did you... that come from? You told me that you were <laughs> like, you like didn't slightly. watch as many films. I, no, but it I was, was just on a podcast your... talking to someone that when I, when I was watching these movies at six years old. I think you have yeah, a different you podcast. Say that you're, you're... <laughs> I remember this story. You really got into horror because you're- Pastor stepdad started showing it to you when you were slightly yeah, older. Mixing two stories, really but we'll get there because that's in my five. So we'll talk. Yeah, mixing two stories. I've been doing this for stories. twelve years. I know your history. No, but you don't dude. listen. That's the problem. Can we switch BFFs? <laughs> we'll just do a trade, and we'll both we'll have it'll, it'll mix up our marriages here, guys. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to her question. Back to, that. back to that. So I wanted to know kind of like, how did you find your films in the 1980s? Were you Fangoria kids? Were you, um, you know, just video shelf combing? Or was it more of like whatever comes on like late night TNT? Patrick, you can go first because I talked too much for last time. Uh, I started finding movies through books. I would go to the library and just check out. They had those um, Crestwood House books about the classic Universal Monsters. And I would check those out and just memorize all the plots and the mm -hmm. actors and uh, all the different monsters. Um, so that was kind of how I got into it. And then I started getting the more like advanced books with some of the 80s stuff. Um, my parents kind of early let me watch a movie that we'll get to. And then once they let me watch that, then kind of the gloves were off and I was able to watch most of what I wanted. Um so I was a, a video store kid as well, or cable, like just, I was rabidly consuming anything I could find. Did your parents restrict your viewing or was it just kind of, you know, whatever? It was kind of whatever. Like I remember 
this isn't horror, but um, I really wanted to see Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And my mom was like, well, I don't know. I'll let your brother watch it. And if he says it's okay, then you can watch it. So I sat in the kitchen and just listened to all of Commando. And then he said it was okay. So then I went right in and watched it probably six times back to back. I love that. No, my mom would always say you can watch it if you watch it with us. So I had these really uncomfortable conversations with my parents like super early on because I wanted to see like Commando. Uh, how about you, Heather? Um, thankfully, I grew up in a house with a single parent. Um, which meant babysitters were expensive. So I just kind of got brought along to everything. Like one of my earliest movie theater rem- like memories is seeing American Werewolf when I was three, um, which was pretty intense. Um, so yeah, you so were like, you were like 10 when that came out. So I don't understand. Well, at least I wasn't, you know, already drinking like you, Patrick, <laughs> 21. So oh, good. It's know. good to see that mom and dad also have issues. I was worried it was just us. I feel well, we're not, it's now. not just us. Not it's just not just us. us. <laughs> it's all horror married couples. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, it was just kind of like an okay thing in our house. Plus like we would, I would always watch like classic monster movies like on the like channel 50 or channel 66 growing up. Elvira was on and Svengooly. Um, So I was really lucky in that regard. And then also to my best friend that I talked about earlier, uh, her parents were super into horror sci-fi. And they were pretty not restrictive about showing us things that we shouldn't have been seeing, like Alien and the Thing at five. That was that was pretty intense. Um, but yeah, so it was just kind of like an open thing. And then one of the movies that I'm going to talk about in my list uh, became sort of my handbook for horror uh, as a kid when I'd walk through video stores because we had a few that we would always go to. Um, yeah, and I just kind of always like kind of kept being obsessed by it. So. Yeah, that was kind of it. That's why we're all um, still here. Only, yeah, there was only two that my mom said specifically I wasn't supposed to watch. One was The Exorcist, because she gets really freaked out at religious horror. Uh, when she joined Netflix years ago, the first movie I put on her queue was Paranormal Activity. And she called me the next day and she was just like, how could you let me rent that demonic movie? She's like, I put that thing, like I left my house and put it back in the mailbox. I didn't even want it in my house. And I was like, oh my God. I couldn't um, stand yeah. that Mika guy. <laughs> I mean, nobody can. He's a dick. Um, but so The Exorcist was one. And the other was actually Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. which a movie I'm going to talk about kind of got me around that for the most part. And then my babysitter ended up like accidentally renting it for us because she was tired and wasn't paying attention. And just she we had a grocery store called Dominic's in Chicago. And for a long time, they actually had a video store in there. Um, and my babysitter part-time worked at Dominic's. So she would just send us over to the video store and just give us some money and we'd rent stuff and they wouldn't even ask us because really, you know, we were with Leah. And basically that's how we ended up getting Texas Chainsaw. And then I think I turned it off like 20 something minutes in because it was too much. Because of Franklin? <laughs> so Franklin blow, blowing raspberries? You're like, I'm out. I'm, it's too much. <laughs> too sexual. That is a good question. Like what was the one that like messed you up the no, most? No, this, this is too what? early. That's the back end of the show. <laughs> too early? This, <laughs> this is the back end of the show? not the list. Oh. Let's, let's save it for the list. Unless it's not uh, on your list. If it's not on your list. I was going to say, no, like, that doesn't necessarily mean okay. it's on the list that it fucked you up for life may not be on Mine the is. list, Kane. Mine is. Oh my god! Then don't talk. Okay. Well, I want to ask about the book. <laughs> I was scared of the thriller video when I was little. Oh, yeah. uh, I could watch a lot of movies, but the thriller video—it was specifically the when he changes into the werewolf cat monster, because um, it seemed like it hurt, and I didn't like that it seemed like the transformation hurt. So I would leave the room for that part and listen to it, much like Commando, and then come back and watch the zombies dance. Do you, do you know it was the, that was too scary that it was vincent price that was his voice that was too scary for me i couldn't handle hearing him do that boy i didn't know who he was but when that part came on i'd be like oh i can't take this like i'm spooked out <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i couldn't do the end of the video I, I could watch everything up to that but as soon as he turned his head and smiled with the yellow eyes i was out so that was my moment but i was actually obsessed with the thriller vhs release because it had the behind the scenes because i didn't have cable and because we, I grew up in a trailer park and they didn't have cable. Um, so a friend of mine, like her dad bought us the VHS tape. So I got to watch like the BTS like a ton. And I think that was actually when for me, things with like special effects started to click because I was like, I just assumed all these things existed. I thought the aliens and the thing were real and they were going to get us eventually. We just weren't paying attention because we're just watching a movie. So yeah. Uh, Thriller is huge. 
I've uh, talked about my my um, relationship with demons too, and the demon coming out of the TV, which like fucked me up for life. But another one, big one for me was um, uh, Sleepy Hollow, the Horseman at the end. Oh my god! I mean, I was probably maybe four. My parents showing me that, like, I hadn't even started school yet, and um, you know, you sit through Mr. Toad and All's Well, and then you get to the Sleepy Hollow part, and when he comes down in that scream at the end, that. I don't even know if I still have watched the whole thing the whole way through. I, for some reason, it still like affects me the same as it did when I was four. It, they are they're spooky. Um, I did want to oh, wait, but that would have. I'm sorry, we were talking 80s. That would have predated 80s. My bad. So I was specifically it... thinking like what destroyed me. Sleepy Hollow is definitely pre 80s. Um, that you probably would have seen before. it in the 80s. But though, yeah. I was thinking demons too, and then that led me to like my real terror, which is the headless horseman. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to ask, like doing the book, we we're kind of alluding to 80s burnout, but also like going through all those titles again, obviously rewatching some of them, I'm sure uh, maybe some discoveries in there as well. What did, did you, did anything start clicking to what's missing in contemporary movies most that they had in the 80s for you? Uh, like when you're, when you're writing something as deep and watching even bad, even a movie that doesn't even work great, maybe like a night beast has some sort of magical factor about it that afterwards you're like, why is yeah. this so damn charming? But if this came out right now and it was on VOD, it would be impossible to get through for some reason. Not the exact movie, but the, that same type of movie. So it, did anything come to mind that might be missing that we had in the 80s? Night Beast is such a weird one because it literally stars the least attractive people to ever be in a movie, but I couldn't put that in the book. So I just had to find a nice way to be like, this is charming. Especially for an erotic um, scene. With the, There's an erotic scene. It's pretty wild. <laughs> and I love that when Elric's trying to think of what we're missing now that we had in the 80s, the first thing he thinks of is, it's Night Beast. It's got <laughs> to be Night extreme Beast. extreme example. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's imagination. I, I've referenced, I've been listening to Elric and Becca podcast for 12 years. And so I've heard Elric say before, uh, what's special about the 80s is like imagination and the budgets to realize that imagination, or I'm paraphrasing, but... Um, I, it, for me, it's imagination because now, you know, we can really do anything special effects wise, but we're sort of limited in weirdness i think um i mean there's definitely weirdness going on especially in the indie space but in mainstream horror it's just it it it's not as creative as it was in the 80s and it's not as fun most of the time mm. yeah i think for me i think it's like an aversion to risk because growing up like around like canon or new world pictures i mean i was upset anything that had new world pictures on it i rented it um and we don't have a lot of that business. Like we've got a real, like seeing how far independent horror has come over the years and the different waves of it and what kind of like comes through those like doors and like becomes like a trend or something like a really great moment, like in this ever evolving like pantheon of horror. Wow, that sounds like super elevated. But um, I think for me, it's like we're missing like, you know, night beast or like dead heat like something like mm -hmm. dead heat would just never happen today and it's not because we're like you know too whatever it's because we just simply won't take those kind of risks okay. i missed you know i miss guys like larry cohen or frank hennenlot or you know going out on the streets and just making whatever and like putting taking that risk like i we, we sit there we talk about like independent horror but like so many budgets are coming through and it's like you know, here's my $1 million independent horror movie. First of all, kudos that you got money. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, don't squander that opportunity. But like, I kind of miss like the $30,000 indie, you know, horror movies that just do what they can with what they've got. And I think Host was a movie that really proved that you don't have to have a million dollars to make a killer horror movie. And I wish we saw more of that. Um, so I think that's for me is just like, I just want to see wacky shit. Like, give it to me. I don't care. Like, it just feels like there's so many people trying to ape certain trends where like, I just, I just want weird shit. Like, just give me everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think is we are very much in a time right now of um trend chasing of of kind of like you know we track what we think is doing well oh the a24 films are doing well and that's what everything is going to look like the next year and um because of that like when i was looking back through the 80s stuff this morning it was the sheer variety of subgenres that we had going on where it was slashers raining but then we had just utterly bonkers stuff and aliens and even the small budgets had 
big ideas. Like I remember um, when I was at Blumhouse for a stretch, they always had this saying and it was like um, high, uh, it was like high production, but low budget. And the idea that it's like super, like a big concept, even if you're putting it into a tiny budget, like the first purge was that huge idea, tiny budget. And I felt like that's a lot of what the eighties were is, you know, night beast is really tiny, but that's such a big giant, you know, world changing plot that we just don't necessarily get now because we are trying to trend chase and keep it. If you're making a $30,000 film, it's going to feel $30,000 size too. So yeah. And it's, the practical it's effects, different. like, right. Like if night beast was CG now, would we care? But the fact that it is a person in a suit and it's just this a really cool costume and goofy and he's got a laser blaster and a cool silver he looks like bob dylan in a silver suit like what's up it's like i'm interested you know <laughs> but but i think you know as somebody who's written a book on fx and and practical makeup and stuff heather it's like that is a big shift not because the filmmakers don't want to use that stuff it's because people are always in a hurry everything's about oh it's quicker let's do cg and i'm just i'm just never been convinced that that's been the right direction yeah. for anything you know so what was, um, when you were watching your 72 films for the the book, what were the ones that you had never seen before that you were like, holy shit, this is finally the chance I get to watch The Changeling. Like what was one that for each of you that you had never seen before, but you suddenly found yourself watching? Or was there one? I had probably five that I had never seen before. And I think my favorite of the five was Russell Mulcahy's Razorback. <laughs> nice. Very badass movie, especially the opening. Holy shit. It just looks amazing. I just mm. love all the crazy back backlighting and, uh, you know, a, a, it's Moby Dick with a boar. How can you not love it? <laughs> that is such a good description of it. I hope you put that in the book. Did, wait, did Moby <laughs> Dick, the book, did the book have rapey Australian punks? Because I don't remember that part it did they were on another oh, okay, boat okay. we passed um it was really <laughs> okay, cool they I... screamed over good day mate and then they went yeah because yeah. every australian film from that era has at least three of them <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i was trying to think and i don't think that there was anything on my list that i hadn't seen but there were a few things that i hadn't seen in a lot in a while um and it was nice because like in some cases, you have to kind of just put any sort of preconceived notions or passionate feelings you have towards a movie and come at it from a completely sort of middle ground perspective where it's like, I I may not love this movie, but I'm going to meet it where it's at kind of scenario. And so I, th I think probably once you get later on in the 80s, it was like, okay, 976 Evil, let's do this. <laughs> and you know, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna take this. And you know, it's never a movie that I'm ever gonna quote as one of my favorite '80s movies. I was gonna say, movies. has it improved but, with time? Is it one of those where, like, you know, if I rewatch it now, I'm gonna be like, it's better than I thought when I was 16. Yeah, I mean, that one I saw actually uh, in theaters because I begged my mom because it was Robert Englund directing oh. uh, and Evil Ed starring in it. So I was like, I have to see this movie. I'm st I still, I feel bad that it took her to see that movie. Oh my God. Um, but now I'm kind of seeing it from like, trying to understand like Robert's perspective. Cause I did like, you know, listen to the commentary. Uh, I watched some interviews that he did from back in the day. I think I might've even read something in, in like one of the old Fangoria issues as well. Um, and just kind of understanding the perspective he was coming at it from. And realizing, like, okay, you can set out to do a certain thing with a movie. What happens in the end, it may not be exactly what you were intending. But as long as that intention's there, like, I can appreciate that. Um, so, he, you know, he, he went in there thinking he was going to make a certain type of movie. Budget and other restrictions proved otherwise. But, like, I definitely like it a lot more now than when I was a kid, for sure. Um, there's actually quite a few 80s horror movies that we didn't get to write about for the book. Um, that I've done that with, but I think my biggest is probably still Fright Night Two. I love I Fright was... Night Two. Oh gosh, one of the best. so good. One of the best sequels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But as a kid, I was I was ready to flip cars at the drive-in. I was that was me at Halloween Three. You know, as a kid, like renting it and you and 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 fr Friday Thirteenth Five. Like they were the two things because you're just in the zone when you're a kid. <laughs> And you want more of the same, but then now at this age, I, I I think both are fantastic because they're so different and fun, and it, it's nice. That's one good thing about aging, I guess. 
<laughs> yeah, mine's yeah. all the Amityvilles where it's like, it's the haunted mirror. Here's the haunted doll, the haunted lamp. And now <laughs> I'm like, I will watch those anytime. It doesn't matter what haunted object is. I'm totally fucking in. But at the time I was like, but I want the house. And yeah. yeah. Uh, can One thing before we get into our more personal kind of journey through the 80s. Uh, talk us to us a little bit about the layout because I was flicking through the PDF of it, the book, and also just I know this version of it just is going to be probably even sold out now, or it's very close to it. Versus there will be eventually be a paperback for like talk us through all that stuff just so people know. But I thought the layout was super cool because it was year by year, but there would also be these cool asides like um, where you'd look at the top, you know, m- other movies that were non horror that year, a- each year, and music, what was happening in the music charts, it's just stuff that painted a picture of the decade, not just in horror, but to kind of reflect uh, also what was going on in the culture, which I thought was really cool. But just just so people can visualize this if they haven't got their copy. Yeah, I think for me, because I'm such a nerd for like details, like it was about kind of giving people context. Um, Because I know that this book is going to appeal to a lot of folks our age, but I want you know, younger generations, maybe even older generations who in the 80s were like, oh, you damn kids with your rock and roll or whatever. Um, You know, that the there's something to like give them a, a like paint the picture of what it was like kind of being in that like era Patrick <laughs> era um and experiencing that stuff first I I I really again it kind of ties into one of my movies on my list but it's like I just really wanted to give people the that experience of like being there in the 80s what it was what was going on in the world why were these movies coming up because that art I think always kind of reflects where we are at you know culturally at the time and that I don't even mean that in a political way I just mean like you know punks are a thing and then we've got you know turn of the living dead and things like that you know what I mean like there, it's it's not just like a little tiny sliver of what was really happening in those years so I really wanted to do that kind of stuff also just because I kind of love it like I used to read like the like I forget what the publisher was but like these like weird like yearly almanac things um, cause I worked at the store of knowledge, which was like a PBS store and we sold these things and I would like get caught in the back reading all the time. Uh, cause I'm like, what was going on in 1957 and just you're reading all this stuff. So I wanted to give people that kind of experience. And then also too, I think it was like, you know, as much as horror has shaped us, it's also kind of cool to see what else was going on in, in the movies at the same time, because as much as I loved horror, I was seeing everything. Um, so I wanted for people who maybe weren't quite aware of like, other movies that were really I mean although like who doesn't know Empire Strikes Back um but like just kind of on that, like if they were going to show up at a multiplex you know in 1985 what's going on you know I love what that. is everybody going to uh, well I love the charts with the uh film top gross because like I I only flipped through some of them but when I got to the one where Beetlejuice is the number one in the horror top 10 and it's number 10 so it did crack the 10 of the mainstream uh list too for, which is you know it's always kind of exciting to see that horror's always been profitable always has always broken through in some capacity you know and this is people oh. forget Go people ahead. forget just how big crocodile dundee was <laughs> it was huge i watched that with my parents and then we bought it it may have been one of the first vhs tapes that my parents bought um but I, we had we watched that thing and crocodile dundee 2 where it was in where he's, where he's dynamite to catch, catch fish at the start i remember that one <laughs> <laughs> I honestly I know you're joking Patrick but I literally just watched both Crocodile Wendy and Truth and I I've seen like three weeks ago um so I love that you made that reference and it was huge it was huge. It, it was, was. A, it, was a, it was a global juggernaut I mean, the, of a the movie. joke is it's not like this in Australia that's the one joke wouldn't that have been cool if they cast him in Rogue and the other Australian like alligator movies like how cool would that be to recast those movies and have mick dundee uh yeah i think they missed about making him an exploitation character actually i think that'd be more fun but uh yeah actually i feel like he should be doing like he should be in a wolf creek now i would totally like that. Didn't, didn't he win an oscar though for that screenplay i know he was at least nominated for the crocodile dundee screenplay i'm not joking That's wow it's a real thing crazy but but be- yeah, believable gosh. because I mean people were flipping out about it. I mean even in New Zealand where we're not quite Australian, everyone was finding it funny and humorous and loving in the same way. I don't know how it was received in Australia itself, but that would be interesting. I think that'd be. A... I think they were into yeah, it. Yeah, which I is funny. Really? <laughs> I mean, it was it was huge for tourism. Yeah, yeah that makes that sense. Yeah, yeah, 
That was the birth of Outback Steakhouse in the U.S. as well. We went through this little like Australian fever time period. So yeah, El- Elric will tell you all about the authenticity of the bloom and onion. The fa- oh, the so. fads. I mean, that's the the thing about it. We're talk- joking about getting old, but I do. I have zero regrets that I got to be a kid in the '80s and got to go to video stores and yeah, things that yeah. have really just completely shaped who you become and and you just feel spoiled because especially when I look at you know what what options younger people have now it's like it looks like you have all these options but they're all the same and they're all it's 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 just so I don't know it's, it feels preordained by computer choices unfortunately so here's an interesting phenomenon that I have noticed with 80s horror kids that I have not been able to track to another area and I'm looking for it we can remember VHS covers lightning fast even if we never saw the movie it's things like Elric a couple of weeks ago on our Patreon show came on and was like, well, I finally saw Terror at 10 Killer. I have never seen that movie, but immediately I could describe that box cover down to what the woman in the lake with one hand being pulled down was wearing. And I don't even know why that is. And I don't know if it's something where we were looking at these at such a young age that it was really impactful because seriously, I could not remember like my algebra textbook with quite that, quite that same capacity or at all. But it's just things like, and then he'll, you know, pull out deep cuts that I have never seen, but I will remember the box cover like I was staring at it this morning. (laughs) And I don't think I can do that with anything else. And I don't know if it tracks across anything else or if it was just that we were so obsessive with these films when we were looking at them at such a very impressionable age that they just stuck with us. And I assume I'm not the only one that has this ability. No, you you guys (laughs) talked about, you know, if we experienced... 80s burnout and truthfully i didn't um because there was so much variety because one week you're writing about basket case and the next week you're writing about the shining and it's like these movies couldn't be more different but they both came out in the same decade um the only downside was that like we were writing in chronological order and by 89 things were kind of falling off Mm -hmm. um and so the movies it's not even that they weren't like as good. I mean, in some cases, like now you're writing about Jason takes Manhattan as opposed to, you know, Friday four. Um, but also I had like Henry portrait of a serial killer just hanging over me. Like, Oh, that's in 89. That's uh, like, I almost oh, that's a rough one. Yeah. Like I'm, so, I'm great, so sorry. I really you know, am. It's, it's a great movie. It's not that it's a bad movie, but it's just like, I it's, it's just waiting for me. Like I'm going to have to revisit that movie. And I was kind of dreading it. It wasn't as uh, upsetting this time as it was the first time I saw it. Wow. Which uh, maybe I just was desensitized by writing about 71 other movies. Yeah, You got darker. Yeah, I think that's what it <laughs> is. Lane, you you know, changed, you Patrick, you changed. Yeah. You're like those characters. Camcorder. It's <laughs> yeah, I really am. It's... No, but I think that, <laughs> that the thing about the art is interesting that we remember. I think partly too, I think the art in that era and, and especially the teaser trailers and stuff was just to like, it was like whatever it takes to make people want to see it. Like that's the only mandate. It's not about reflecting the real movie. And then now it's like, okay, well, as long as all five cast members' faces are photoshopped on the cover, it's good. And it kills me, some of the art. I feel like we still have it to a degree. Because if you look like, um, think about the cover of the film Absentia when it came out. It was like the year where every single cover had this girl being pulled away. It was on Yellow Brick Road. And like that girl was in like, two of those movies if that and the rest of it it was just photoshopping they were picking up just clip art and I still feel that to a degree where a lot of times like what is going on the covers of things when it's heading into especially if it's a VOD platform like a Netflix or a Tubi what is going on those covers is not necessarily what you're going to see in the movie which might go back to what Joe Bob Briggs said which is the only place to find exploitation films now is like lifetime and like the marvista titles and that's where our exploitation grindhouse lives now but even the cover art on like tubi i was scrolling through like new horror releases on tubi the other day and even those those covers don't stick with you the mm-hmm. way that like Fu- do you guys remember future kill like the geiger yes. drawing the, the hand, hand, the hand. The actually that the might be an example like... i don't know if i ever even watched it but i know the cover i've never perfect. seen it yeah. I own you don't it. have yeah. to it's not never it's not good it. but yeah. the cover art is yeah. amazing and like you won't find anything like that for like a, a new horror movie that like shows up on tubi yeah 
The one that I always talk about that I, it took me forever to rent it because I was so scared of the artwork was Body Shop. It's not even a good movie, Um, (laughs) but it was just like disembodied body pieces on the front. And then you flip it over and it's just four disembodied pieces. And it took me forever to rent that thing because I was so freaked out by it. And then there were other ones. Um, It wasn't a great movie. It was okay. It was okay. It wasn't worth me waiting like 10 years of going, I don't know if I can handle this. (laughs) Um, But then the other one that I always look at that I use when I'm teaching marketing in class is the Headless Eyes poster because it is such a great poster. Like that poster just freaking slaps. I must have rented that movie five different times because I would forget that I had seen it over and over. Um, So it was one of those movies, but man, that poster got me every single time. So yeah, it was just great art. We just, uh, I don't think we see it as much with the Tubi posters. Yeah, it's not, it's not the same level of tantalizing art where I'm immediately like, great poster. Yeah, maybe it'll change again. Um, I did want to ask you guys uh, with the book. Okay, so the hardback is sold out or isn't sold out, just to be clear? Not quite? No, um, not quite. Uh, we I actually just got an email from our publisher this morning. So we have about 250 left. Okay, cool. Um, they printed 1,513. Um, and some of those are already put to the side for the uh, the signing that we have next month. I, when um, is but- that, by the way? Uh, that's April 27th at Dark Delicacies at Bur- in Burbank, California. Um, yeah, so that's, um, we're, we're getting close, but he said we've been getting consistent orders every day, which I'm like kind of surprised and very humbled by um, and appreciative for. Um, yeah, so, but when these are gone, they're gone. Yeah, and and so. at some point, there were, but not straight away, right? Months down the track, there'll be a soft cover at some point, right? Yes, yes, we're definitely going to be doing a soft cover version. Um because I'm a masochist. Uh, I don't think I've even said this to Patrick yet. We might actually be adding some stuff yes. to the soft cover. Are you excited? Are you ready? You don't get paid more. more? <laughs> Surprise, Patrick. Now there's um, a chapter on microwave massacre. Oh, yeah, somebody's favorite. One of Elric's faves. He dates. That was one of the VHS covers that scared me. Ah, yeah, yeah. I see that. <laughs> yeah. It was that and the Company of Wolves. I couldn't. <gasps> Company I, of Wolves? Yeah, mm. that's dark. That one's fucked up. It's still yeah. fucked up. Great movie, but that wolf mouth coming out of the mouth, it that one messed me up too. That was another one that I don't think I rented until I was probably in college. Um, all right. I, I I have... I'm sorry. No, no that, that's, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so we, we're getting pretty close, but yeah, when they're done, they're done. And then we are going to do the soft cover version. Hopefully um, sometime this fall Did slash winter. Call it the before... soft core version. Of course. Oh, They're editing Henry out of the oh, list. Fuck. Maniac is gone. <laughs> no, we're, gonna, with we're, gonna, films. we're gonna insert some other movies instead. Oh, right. um, <laughs> from, from the 80s Skin and Max era. Um, <laughs> cool. But yeah, so I because I like look, I know like $85 is a huge ask. Trust me, I get it. Um, I have a list about you know, three pages long of movies I can't wait to get, but I'm waiting for my bonus. So like, I totally get it. Um, But if you are ready to like spend that kind of money, like we just, I wanted this to be something where even if you think you're the most hardcore horror fan out there that you, you know, everything, nobody can tell you anything. um, Totally get it. If that person can walk away from this book and they've learned one thing, then I feel like I did what I came to do with this um, because we didn't want to rehash the documentaries. Um, they exist. You can watch them all the time. We weren't trying to do that whatsoever. We wanted to sort of bring something different that sort of was like in correlation with what they already did with the doc. Because again, you know, if they were going to do, you know, 10 minutes on each movie, like, you know, they'd still be in the middle part too right now. Um, you know what I mean? Like you're, it's just, it's an impossible feat. So this is really so in support of what the documentary already was. And I just want people to get something new out of it. Um, you know, I love the little trivia blocks that you had. I think that's really clever. They're really neat. I will tell you like my biggest takeaway from this entire experience. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, because this is like something you, you see from time to time. But writing this book made me a shit ton better at trivia. Um, <laughs> I noticed the last like, time you showed up, like, and you're killing they it. They rock now. <laughs> it's weird because, like, I'm like way more dialed in. Where like I'm actually recalling things that like two years ago I would have never been able to do, and I'm like, oh shit. So like, if anybody out there is looking to get better at trivia, like this could be your book. 
It's like the yeah, opposite of podcasting. Podcasting makes you so much dumber. <laughs> like over time, I forget everything now because I'm talking about so many movies. I'm just like, it's the worst. Yeah, movie. that's it exactly. Is like when I look back and I'm like, <laughs> I watched 300 films this year. I can remember 10 of them. Yeah, like it's just yeah. so much. So the great yeah, amnesia. no, but Heather has been rocking trivia she for has. the past couple of yeah, months. She's... We have noticed. Tokyo, it's been weird. they're lucky to have you. I know, and I'm going to miss this week, so I feel really bad, so hopefully they do. Oh, okay. no, that's great. Uh, great for our team. Thank you. Uh, Boggy <laughs> Creek. Yeah, you're welcome in advance. Yeah, go Boggy <laughs> Creek. Well, well, we just on. booked a waffle truck today. I'm oh, excited no. about oh, the waffles. So. Uh, right. Speaking oh. of waffles, in the 80s, there are such great waffles that sometimes your parent would make you. Uh, all right, so we're going to do a quick kind of a round robin kind of journey through the 80s uh, obviously shout out to the movies that made us podcast which is a podcast where they just literally talk about the movies and i think the definition there is really um not the cool deep cuts that we love now that we look back at having missed but really films that when you saw it and made a huge impact in whatever way and kind of shaped how you became you as horror fans and i think i thought all our listeners, like the people who've been following you guys for years and us, might find it kind of fun. Some of these stories they will have heard before. But uh, so let's just do a round robin. I'll, because Zoom's so confusing. Uh, why don't we go Heather, Patrick, Becca, me, and then we'll keep going in a loop, if that's cool. So take us from your number. I, I don't if, don't know if you did it in chronological or just impact, however you want to take it. I just wrote a list. Yeah, cool. Um, so. Because it's it's hard for me to rate. I hate numbers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I would say the first movie that I would talk about when I talk about the movies that made me in the eighties and sort of made me in the horror fan I am. Um, and it's something I've championed and mentioned many, many times it's tearing the aisles mm. um, because that became my Bible uh, as a blossoming horror fan in the eighties um, that really opened my eyes to a lot of movies. I may not have, you know, rented otherwise um, like Suspiria at eight uh, vice squad at eight. Um, you know, wow, that's I way before me. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, those aren't movies I recommend to eight-year-olds. Um, but it was cool because it was like an education. And it also became sort of like a fun challenge because I would take the cover from Tarrant the Isles because the skull is all the words or all the titles. And I would just go and start looking for movies wherever I could find them. Um, weirdly enough, more often than not, they weren't in horror. They were in like thriller and drama and that kind of stuff. But that's okay. It was still a good time. So yeah, Tarrant the Isles is huge for me. That's cool. Nice. We went to the video store like, do you guys have Nighthawks? <laughs> <laughs> I might have actually, because I did rent Nighthawks. That was, that because was, it was in that part. movie. It's like prominently yeah. featured in that movie. Yeah. yeah and it's still owned. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to kick us off with one of my gateways um, that I ended up obsessing over everything that they made during this time was Ghoulies um, from 1984, because this um, I watched as soon as it hit VHS. I remember like my parents renting it. I was probably 1984. I don't think I was more than maybe five years old at the time. Um, and it was just everything. And now that I watch it, I'm like, I can't believe my parents ever stopped me from watching any of this shit. Like there's sex scenes in it. It opens with them, like pushing out some girl's um, beating heart. And it's just, they're Satanists and they're fun Satanists the whole time. Um, and then the toilet demon, which is why I thought it was hilarious at the time. And then the two little goblin creatures, my name's Gerda. I am Hilda. I don't even remember what their names are. Um, but it's got these two little like goblin creatures that serve him. And I thought that they were just absolutely awesome. I would have wanted to be Jonathan in this movie. I was never interested in the good or the bad, but Jonathan had ghoulies and that was kind of the amazing part of it. But this was such a strong gateway horror that I don't even think was ever intended to be a gateway horror. But let me just say that um, after this, I had four Boglins, four. So um, yeah, I had I had my ghoulies right there and they never came to life or did anything, but I owned four Boglins. Wow. Heather was very kind because she knows what a Charlie Band fan I am. So she let me do most, if not all, of the Empire movies in the book. Nice. <laughs> and I was so excited every time one came up because talk about, you know, something that's missing now is like a, a studio like Empire with just, again, big ideas, small budgets, like yeah. you were saying, and uh, so much creativity, you know. And there are so many, they were making so many of those like ones that they were filming out of Europe in the castles that every couple of months, I still end up covering one on deep cuts. Cause I'm like, well, I discovered this one I've never seen before. And they're all like super sexy and shot in a castle with monsters. Maybe or it's the castles but we're missing. They're all really fun. That's we need castles. Castles. castles anyway. That's what it's all. Eastern Europe's still there guys. You can still go to Bucharest. 
it still the exists. Romanian castles were set. Well, they were Italian because Charlie Band's dad, I think, That's was like it. a realtor uh, in Italy. So yeah, they had like a couple different castles that they used over the years. So now he shoots at a mansion in Cleveland, and it's just not the same. Cleveland's just not the same. Uh, what about you, Pat? Uh, my first one is Creep Show. Uh, which was like the first R-rated horror movie that my parents were going to allow me to see. And it was this big event in my life. It was like, yeah, I'm going to see Creepshow. I was so, I had seen the picture of like Ted Danson and, and, uh, and uh, what's her name from Dawn of the Dead in the seaweed. And I was like, I got to see this movie. Um, our VCR broke. So I couldn't see Creepshow. We went out and rented a VCR from 7-Eleven because you used to be able to do that. You can do, do that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's how I saw Creepshow. Um, I was fine with it. I did great until the cockroaches burst out of E.G. Marshall at the end. And then I was like, uh-oh, too much. And that was the part that I was scared of for years. Um, but that opened up a new world to me because once I saw Creepshow, that became the card that I would constantly play. Like, can I see this movie? No, it's rated R, but you let me see Creepshow. You're right, son. And they would just let me watch uh, whatever I wanted. Can I make a, a horrible admission that, like, you guys can revoke my horror card if you want? I can't watch the last segment of Creepshow. Mm. Is that the I, Roach one? Yeah. Uh-huh. Because it's weird. I grew up without cockroaches. Like, I just didn't have them growing up whatsoever. And then I moved to LA and no matter what you do, there's cockroaches and it mm -hmm. freaks me the frick out. So I can't, I cannot watch the last segment. So we literally, once it like transitions over, go right to the end and we're back to uh mustacheless Tom Atkins being a dick. Um, Cause I just can't, I, it's weird. It's worse than you I used know. To watch it I get it. Fine. But it's worse than you know because we were, when we were doing the show at Blumhouse, we met somebody who worked has worked there for thirty years. I can't remember who it was. And behind the scenes, he told us that he was on Creep Show, and he said he went to the ta they went to this town and, and Charles. Who, yes, I, I can't remember. Charles. And they basically said we infested that town when we left. That town still has an infestation problem of cockroaches, like these very specific types, and it's like a nightmarish kind of scenario. So it's actually scarier than even the movie. Maybe that's yeah. why we need CGI. When I lived Cockroach. in New York, there were cockroaches in every. I lived in New York City for for like ten years. There were cockroaches in every building. They were in your basement. It didn't like it was only a matter of how much you controlled them, is whether or not you saw them in your apartment. If you had boric acid around your base, you weren't going to see them in your apartment, but you would still see them in the hallways and the basements of all the apartment buildings. Here in LA, I never see them inside, but as soon as you step out on any sidewalk, and they're the size of hamsters here. I am not kidding. They're so goddamn big way bigger than I ever saw in New York City. They are just like the sunlight and the, the LA environment just makes them get massive. Yeah. Yeah. I we are sliding doors to like our balcony um, doesn't quite close all the way. So there's like a gap that we just literally can't do anything about. Even when the doors close, we still get rain and stuff inside our apartment. So when they crawl up the wall, they crawl through our balcony and we'll be literally sitting there at night and just look up onto the ceiling and there's this ginormous thing. And I'm just like, okay, time to go. And I grab my dogs and I run because I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. I can't like, it's, it's so stupid. I were so quick. I was, oh God. Anyway, I cannot watch the Anna Creep show. Oh, I want that watch along like party with you. <laughs> I feel like such a wuss, but I just can't. Do but it. I love that because really it means can't. we still, I mean, we're all, we all still have our weird things, you know? And it's like, you don't want to get so yeah. hardened and Jaden with hard that you can just anything goes you still want something that you're like uh, friction with um yeah. yeah i'm surprised we have this one in common actually patrick because you are at least a decade older than me from what we've i've already established in the show but somehow some oh we're such a young turk y'all uh, my number five is also creep show but from a completely different angle it couldn't be a more different angle you excitedly wanting to see it me i'd only seen i was five years old i had only seen star wars basically in gandhi and that's all i was into not gandhi but i had seen gandhi uh lots of star wars and one day my mother was out and she was dating this guy. So that's why it's two different stories, Becca. Wait, this is just some dude. This is still in America. Yep. This is not the minister. Uh, we're in America. Is this in Pennsylvania? No, somewhere in New York. It's actually in Woodstock, weirdly enough. I lived in Woodstock for a year. Um, and he calls up to me and my sister, who she's five years older, and says, oh, kids, Little House on the Prairie's on. And that was the show we're all into. We ran downstairs. He closed the door and in my memory, bolt locked it behind him. 
took out a VCR that they had thing and put in Creep Show. Now I did not know it was Creep Show for about another seven or eight years after this, because I basically had nightmares for a long period based on this. That's what I remember. Yeah, this movie totally fucked me up. But the only thing I remembered in the memories were uh, the crate monster Fluffy, and I would just see this creature, and then I'd have nightmares that he was coming out of my wall and stealing me as a kid and taking me into the wall. It was real, real vivid. And the more I think about that movie, I think it's because of the lighting, pa- the EC comic lighting pattern, which to us as adults makes it cartoony and and less real. Like it's opposite of like the A twenty four thing. I think as a kid that accentuates why it feels even more nightmarish. And really fucked me up. So, but it took me years before I realized what the movie was because I had I wasn't thinking, you know, straight when he showed us this movie. And man, creep show. So it's the most significant. There's another film at the end of the list that's the most important to me that I chose. But of the films that I didn't choose, it's easily the thing that most had an impact on me. I'd say because of you know it's that ground zero horror. So that's our first one. All right, let's keep keep the round yeah. off and moving. Heather. Okay, um, so my next choice is um, a movie that was like hugely pivotal in my childhood. Um, that I it was something I kind of came across, and it became quickly one of my all time favorites. Um, and that's Toby Hooper's Poltergeist, um, because I still have very vivid memories of seeing that, and it really it was one of those horror movies. Like when you're a little kid, like it feels like in some ways safe, and then he completely pulls the rug out from underneath you multiple times so that when he builds that, that false sense of security up again, you're like, Oh no, 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 no. We're the nightmares are going to continue. Um, and I was obsessed with poltergeist as a kid. It's, um, I still, I still watch it a lot to this day. Um, it still makes me cry. Uh, I think Joe Beth Williams gives one of the best performances in eighties horror in that film. Um, and I just, I love it so much. It's a movie that, um, if we had more time, I could literally do like five hours on Poltergeist. Um, Patrick had, you know, we get to talk about it soon, which I'm excited about. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those movies that like, if my fir- like that was probably my first like horror movie obsession was Poltergeist. Which of the elements, what, did any of the particular elements, like some people, it's the tree, some it's the clown, some it's the wow. corpse, some it's the meat face. What was it for you? Was there the- a specific? The clown in the idea of her being in the TV, because TV was such a pivotal, like, I know it's still a pivotal thing too for most kids, but like, it was extremely pivotal in the 80s, especially if you were a kid who kind of was growing up on your own a lot, and you were a latchkey kid, like, the TV was like, you know, your your best buddy in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um. So the idea of like, you getting pulled into there, this clown doll, which... um. I it's I don't think I've ever really liked clowns, but I especially didn't like them after that. Um, it just like why they would even just keep that doll around afterwards. I just I don't understand it. Um, like and sitting at the foot of the bed when everything else is packed. Um, but yeah, it just it blows my mind every time I watch. I'm like, why is that there? Why are like you guys are moving right now? Get it out of here. So um, but yeah, it's it's just one of those. It, it perfectly captured. I think a lot of the fear that comes from being a child and especially during being a part of that generation and how things were changing. And I think also too, it's a really great take um, on sort of breaking down what like the American family was, what this idea of like community and security was, you know, amongst families in America at the time. Um, yeah. I just, it works on so many different levels. Like I, yeah, I have to shut up. No, it's great. It's great. It's great. I still consider it to be one of the most real portrayal of parents. Um, yeah. Especially the bedtime scenes. I remember looking back at the 80s when I was doing it for a project because we always had to have the quintessential sex scene in the 80s. It was like parents who have been married for 20 years are sleeping in sexy stuff and then going to bed and it's all sexy. And there in this one, he's reading a book on Reikonautics while she smokes a joint. That is every evening for me. <laughs> that was- so I was like... Nothing that was sexy. Sh- Nobody looks hot. We're just in sweatpants and that's it. And that's, that's life. And I and, love it. Yeah. And what's really interesting too, about that scene um, is because it was sort of the quintessential parents of the 1980s. Cause you had all these, these adults who'd come through the sixties, Vietnam and everything like that. So they're still smoking weed, but like, they're also in the Reaganomics because suddenly that's like a thing. Um, and it's such a perfect juxtaposition. Like if somebody did that scene in a very similar style today, like there'd be such backlash against it from like everybody where I'm like, but it feels so like 
authentic and real when you frame it within the context of the 80s. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I still smoke a joint as soon as my kids go to bed. Like, that's just what you do. <laughs> I mean, we're in California. That's like the thing here. But yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's how I get to sleep at night. So, um, yeah. So, okay. So that takes me to Little Shop of Horrors. Mm. Oh. Which version? Which, oh, yeah, of course, the eighties version. Which version? <laughs> um, the the eighties version. So the nineteen eighty six version. Um, so Little Shop of Horrors was definitely not even gateway. Like this was nineteen eighty six. I was like full blown horror junkie by this time. Um, but at the same time, this for me was a big permission slip to let my freak flag fly. Um, The fact that I did love musicals, that I did love kind of this weird twisted element of mixing merriment and horror together, Um, which I'm going to talk about in the first part of the episode with Has Been Hotel, if you haven't been watching that. Um, It's amazing. But just the idea of kind of the happiness of the musical and just um, the singing and the dancing and just turning it upside down and mixing it with just brutal stuff. And that is still, I was just on screen drafts last week for, for horror musicals. And it is still one of my absolute favorite subgenres. little shop. I, um, some kids would probably play Barbie. I closed my door and sang every part of that musical and pretended I was every part. My stuffed animals saw the one person Becca show of little shop of horrors daily for like four years. I hope they enjoyed it. It was amazing as far as I can remember. Um, But yeah, this was such just a massive one for me of kind of letting me know that horror doesn't have to be scary. It's fun. Definitely I want to see theaters, yeah, Rebe- Rebecca do yeah somewhere that's green. I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm kind of an uh, alto tenor, so it was a little <laughs> a little, scr- a little scratchy. <laughs> I, I can relate. Yeah, I, that was actually one that I actually had the soundtrack for before I saw the movie because my mom's boyfriend at the time was working at the distribution center in uh, right outside of O'Hare for Warner Electra Atlantic. So we would get albums ahead of time, and so I knew those songs before I even got to see the movie. Um, and yeah, I love that movie so much. Gosh, yeah. And even the stuff that is not like part of the musical that was not part of the stage show, like, um, the, the whole Bill Murray scene and a lot of the, the add-ins that they get in the cameos, like it just makes it so much better and it's just fantastic. Do you have a preferred ending? Oh, I like it bleak. I like really? don't okay. feed the plants. Okay. Um, so yeah, I know Elric's not a music buff. So um, I did I see this one. I saw it on theaters when I was a kid. But did you have you seen both endings? No, whatever was so in the theater is, is probably the only one I saw. That's the somewhere that's green yeah. ending where at the end Audrey and Seymour run off and they have the beautiful house and then in the foreground you see a tiny little plant in the garden and then there is the ending that comes from the actual stage musical which has this song called Don't Feed the Plant. And it's basically this massive plant takes over the entire world and they filmed it. And I swear to God, it's like seven minutes of footage and it has that seven minutes feels more expensive than the entire film because it's like giant plants wrapping the Empire State Building and tanks and things 30 feet. It's like Godzilla plants coming down the street with all of these tanks and helicopters and all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, how could you guys cut this? Cause it literally feels more expensive than the prior 90 minutes. I like that one because it's true to what the stage version was where there is no hope. Um, there is no someplace that's green. The plants just take over the world, but that's me. Uh, my next one is a nightmare on Elm street that might be on somebody else's list heather it might be on yours um for a lot of reasons uh again so much of my horror consumption as a kid was in like book form and it was based on these movies that i couldn't see and once i was able to see movies because they weren't showing a lot of the universal monsters like on tv regularly and um ex- unlike, except for like svenguli um so I was just reading about them, but then once I was able to start seeing movies, it was like more contemporary stuff like Creep Show, like A Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, that was one that like I think my parents didn't want me to see, but a friend had described it all to me and it sounded like the scariest movie ever made. Uh, and so I went to his house and watched it. And so it has that element of like forbidden fruit that a lot of uh, us horror fans are, kind of seek. Um, and also it's, you know, uh, as we kind of explained earlier, it's a big part of the reason why Heather and I are friends and why this book exists. So I feel like it belongs on my list. 
Uh, we're tracking pretty well here, Pat. My next one's Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. <laughs> Our right. order is, uh, and it was, again, similar thing. I was already getting more into liking horror films, like not being just scared from Creepshow. But uh, friends invited me over, and I got there. And right when, you know, that early part where he just kind of appears for the first time with the first kind of shock, a bunch of them jumped on me because it turned out they had just watched it before I got there. And this was all a practical joke to make me piss my pants, which I didn't, but I almost did. Uh, And it was probably the most scared I've ever been in the moment in my life because it was so timed with the aesthetic of that movie. And that movie is just it's it's a it's a really scary, brilliant movie that also makes you love horror like it does both mm-hmm. and not many it's it's in a category of maybe just a handful of movies that can also both scare you and be one of the greatest creations ever but also just the scene especially in the school like the scenes that just stayed with me forever it's just the scene you know where she's in the school and seeing the the girl in the in the bag body bag being dragged through just little surrealist touches that he added through this because of being able to play with the dream element made this movie so impactful and definitely one of the ones that made me love the genre too so Great choice. Hopefully all five of ours will be exactly the same. And we will reveal we so. are twin, <laughs> even though you're old. <laughs> yeah, so um, actually my next movie is for real on oh, no, Nightmare hey! so We are three for three. Um, yeah, this was a movie that um, I was allowed to see, but it wasn't an easy shot. I had to work for it a little bit. Um, because my mom and my best friend's parents rented it and they were like, we're going to watch it first. Cause we've heard some things. And so we were in her room, just kind of waiting it out and we couldn't wait anymore. So we actually snuck out there and it was the scene, uh, cause we were hiding behind the couch and they were in the middle of the living room watching it. So we're right behind them. And it was the scene where Nancy's running up the stairs and she gets stuck and starts doing the thing. And my friend was like, Oh shit. And like really loud And the parent, like everybody was like, what? And they paused it and they got caught. Um, so I'd wait a few more months and then I was at my babysitter's house and she had on a VHS tape, somebody taped off like HBO or something like it was a, it was a double feature of children of the corn <laughs> and Night ran on street. And I was like, Oh my God, I want to watch this. And I was staying that night at her house cause my mom was working and I was like, Oh, I wonder really want to watch this. And she's like, you got to check with your mama. And I was like, okay, fine. And my mom basically said to my babysitter, she's like, if you want to deal with her, you can let her watch it. And I was like, you wouldn't yes. deal with her. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I mean, I don't even love Children of Corn as a movie, but it's a pretty effective horror movie when you're a kid. Because mm-hmm. um, it feels like the rules are way off. Um, and then so I went from that into A Nightmare on Elm Street, where it just felt like there were no rules. Um, and it scared the shit out of me. Like, I remember that night I had to get up to go to the bathroom. And like, she had this very narrow hallway. And I just remember like folding myself in. And just running straight down the hallway because I didn't want Freddie to come out of the walls to get me. And it's weird because I was like as scared of him as I was. I was obsessed with him. And I was like very shortly after that, I got like a Freddy Krueger poster on my wall. Um, so all my friends thought it was weird when they would come over because like I had like the bop and the team beat little mini posters you'd get. But I also had Freddy Krueger and Hulk Hogan. Yes. I was not a, together, I was yeah. not a cool child. Yeah, I was not a cool child. Um, but so everybody thought I was like this really weird girl because it wasn't like it was just you know pictures of you know i did have a war at wall of the cory though so i had alternating cory came and cory feldman Who, who's laughing now heather who's laughing now exactly <laughs> who's got a book exactly. on the almost sold yeah. out <laughs> yeah so but yeah so nightmare on elm street was absolutely huge for me and that was probably after like poltergeist is like my first obsession then kind of came salem's lot and then came, well, that's weird. That was two Tobys. Um, and then came Nightmare on the Street. So that's probably why we do a podcast, Patrick. That's right. That's, yeah. Um, so yeah. And then a nightmare became like the obsession for me for the 80s. So. Yeah. We all share Nightmare, I think. I mean, I know Beck has nope. a, a different Nightmare, <laughs> but a different one for her at some point. But yeah. Yeah, but I didn't put no, it I on know, the list. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, I didn't catch the nightmares. Um, I started with three. And so that is my favorite of them. And then it wasn't until later that I went back and watched all of them. But because I saw three first, that will always be my fave. Um, so yeah. So my next one is Pumpkinhead mm. from 1988. Um, so Pumpkinhead. I watched at my next door neighbor's house. My next door neighbor was a couple of years older than me, this guy named Matt. And I remember that our parents had all gone 
I, I want to say that they had like a PTA meeting, but honestly, they probably were out drinking. Um, so they'd all gone out drinking and they'd left Matt to babysit me. And again, my parents didn't really care what I watched and neither did his. So we had rented Pumpkinhead from the 7-Eleven, which is where you rented movies. And we could walk to a 7-Eleven from my house. And I remember Pumpkinhead kind of being next level for me because it felt like my home because I'm from like this really rural area of Virginia, this really mountainous area of Virginia. We're in um, the Shenandoah Valley, which is like this valley in the Appalachian Mountains and um, very backwoodsy, especially at the time in the 80s. And it felt like home. And the witch felt like um, the the mountain witchcraft called Granny Witch, Granny Witches um, that we had in the area. And it felt so much like so, like a story I would hear, um, like a story about the area around my house. It felt so much like one of the local ghost stories about the things and the witches in the mountains and don't go to that cabin and things like that. It wasn't until much later that I actually found out that that's not even filmed in Appalachia. It's shot in like Santa Clarita. Oh, and then I was like, oh, fuck. Um, but at the time, it's the Appalachia that, of, of California, <laughs> Santa, yeah, Santa Clarina. Well, LA, um, yeah. So, yeah. We're out here. Um, so yeah, it's the only place we have trees. So I guess we're, we're <laughs> yeah. going up to, to Saugus. Um, but yeah, so, but that the story itself just felt so much like a mountain tale that I had grown up with and Pumpkinhead ended up becoming one of my favorite films throughout most of my youth. And it was one that I remember not sleeping. I remember being up at night thinking about Pumpkinhead and being freaked out by it and the rhyme and everything and the kids, it just, it felt so close to, to what I had experienced in my childhood. I love that you had that experience though, because like my mom's family is from West Virginia. So literally my grandparents lived on a hill that like and just everything behind it was woods. Yep. Um That's so I had, been, I had a very similar reaction because my grandpa growing up, because I had sort of like strawberry blonde hair, they used to call me pumpkin head. <laughs> I made this up after pumpkin head came out because it was too much. Wow. So, so the house I grew up in, well, the par- one my parents still live in, it's three miles from the West Virginia. It's Winchester. So we're at like Martinsburg, oh, okay. West Virginia, Cape and Bridge area. So yeah, it's like all the Yeah, way I know there. where Martinsburg is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, but that uh, my parents back up against um, one of the mountains. And so yeah, like it's straight uphill and, you know, just seeing the woods behind you and the trees around your windows. Pumpkinhead messed me up that night. So Oh, I get yeah. it. It's intense. Uh, mine are just uh, chronological in order of release date, I think. So my next one is Night of the Creeps, um, which I, Heather, you probably heard me talk about this before, but my family would take one vacation a year. I don't, I, I won't be autobiographical about all these, I promise, but we would take one vacation well, we're a year. supposed to be. That's kind of Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. I will be. <laughs> uh, I grew up. No, I'm just kidding. Um we would take one vacation where my dad wanted to fish. So we would drive up to like a North Wisconsin and he would fish for a week. And my parents wanted us to sleep in the car on the way there. So I hated the fishing trip. I was bored. I would read comic books. I would read books. I would burn through all my books and move on to my sister's babysitter's club books. Like, cause I didn't fish, but the best part of the trip was the night before we left because my parents wanted us to sleep. So they would let us stay up as late as we wanted. They would go to bed and they would say, stay up and we could watch anything we wanted on TV, which meant they showed all the freaky horror shit at like 11 PM and midnight on cable. And so that was how I saw night of the creeps for the first time. And I saw a bunch of movies. I saw John Carpenter's the thing that way. I saw a basket case that way. And I saw night of the creeps and night of the creeps, is the first movie I can remember that was like a horror movie that was really funny that pulled from all these different, it's, it's part science fiction. It's part frat comedy. It's part zombie movie. It was like, I didn't know a movie could do that. And it imprinted on me in this major way. Um, Especially because then for a lot of years, it was like hard to see once, uh, it didn't get a DVD release for a long time. It didn't get a Blu-ray release for a long time. And so it was kind of stuck on VHS. And so it existed in my memory as this movie uh, that I thought of so fondly, but I couldn't go back to. Um, But it was just, it was a movie that taught me that like, oh, movies can kind of 
do anything they want. Uh, and it's, it's very quintessentially eighties in that way, because of the way that it wears all these really fun influences. And it's such a, a kind of perfect tonal balance. I think, um, it's a movie that really could only exist in the eighties, which is part of why I love it. It's funny if we were doing trailers that had the biggest influence. Uh, I saw that trailer a hundred times before I saw the film. It was my favorite trailer would come on every VHS tape was night of the creeps. And it was such a good trailer. I mean, had just, you know, your dates are here. The bad news is they're dead. Like all that stuff made me want to see that movie so bad. Um, but funnily enough, my pick isn't that, but it's a similar kind of movie. And this is the most outlier of these for from my favorites. And people don't believe me when I tell this, but in New Zealand, when I was this, whatever age this was, uh, whatever their ad campaign, it had reached the shores of New Zealand saying it was the scariest movie ever made and that most people wouldn't be able to handle it. It was like, and I, you, you're going to laugh now. Uh, and then I saw the poster for it and I was like, oh my God, this looks t- too scary. Now that I've heard that and I had a little hand that said, ding dong, you're dead. And I was like, oh, my oh. God, I'm not going to survive this movie. <laughs> and then I watched House. And even though now I would watch it and laugh, it really, whatever the state it put me in, the first part of that movie, I, to this day, I find that the purple lady, it wasn't it wasn't Bull from Night Court as a Vietnam vet, which should be scary. It was this creature in purple who kept charging out at him and then he cut her up. For whatever reason, that scared the pants off me when i was young um but i do think similar to you as the movie went on i started to realize oh wait this is also making me laugh how can i be scared because a lot of horror comedies are really just comedies that happen to be in a horror genre right they're just totally broad comedies that happen to have a a werewolf or something but this is a true horror comedy where you're scared one moment and then you're laughing the next like reanimator and and it was it was really liberating and exciting and i knew i liked this movie a lot at, at the end of it but whatever their campaign was it was so funny to me to think that this is the movie that people were kind of saying this is gonna be the scariest movie of the 80s uh but i still have a soft spot for it but it's it's kind of an outlier in the others it, it had a big impact but it wouldn't have been like if you ask me my 10 favorites it wouldn't usually come to mind uh but it definitely is it was there so steve minor who has also made a great movie in like every category he's ever been hired in it's kind of yep. remarkable um hard to get him to talk about i've never heard him really talk about horror but would love to who did we we had somebody on shockwaves that worked on house oh, and decker. I fred decker wrote the original decker, that was it yeah, we had fred decker he wrote the original and then yeah. his roommate made it funny basically because he mm-hmm. he was trying to make it pure of scary twilight zone um anyway house purple lady and there's no name for her i keep looking up to try to find a good name for that monster character and i never can find anything it's a shame okay heather hit us with another um yeah so mine is probably pretty obvious if like you've ever seen me on social media um but it was a movie that really sort of changed what i thought i loved about horror on a very significant way. And it was like, I had three movies I was super obsessed with as a kid. This was one of them where like, I, if I was having people over, if I was at somebody's house, I'd be like, okay, we have to watch one of these three movies. Um, and this would be Tom Holland's Fright Night. Um, because I did get, to, I, I did have a childhood where I grew up watching Universal Monster movies, but they were different. I was a little, they were less impactful on me then than they are obviously now because you get it better, I think, as you get older and have a little different appreciation for them. But I still watched them and I was still really fascinated by a lot of those characters. And I, I know I'd seen some Hammer here and there again, like on the weekends and things like that, and then watching stuff again, Bill Vire and Sven Gulli. But what I loved about Fright Night is like, one, I was just obsessed with vampires to begin with. So that was an easy in for me. Um, but then I love the fact that like Charlie Brewster is this hor- like monster kid, which, um, and I've said this before, like, I don't think it's a secret. It's pretty obvious. I think Tom Holland owes, owes a lot to Salem's lot with what he does with Fright Night. And I think it's all love. Um, you know, there's a lot of same setups. You've got the characters that are kind of mingling in the same way. Um, there's definitely a different spin on it. And I love the fact that again, I think Tom Holland did two of the best sort of horror movies about single, like kids being raised in single parent environments, dealing with like really shitty situations. And again, that's something I kind of appreciated uh, just based on things I was going through. Um, But I love Charlie Brewster and I loved Ed. I loved Amy. I love Jerry Dandridge still do, you know, every, like that, that movie to me was just such a wonderful, like reintroduction to sort of a completely different experience for horror 
Um, because I was watching mostly like Friday the 13th movies or Nightmare on Elm Street movies or, you know, I wasn't really getting to get that kind of an experience. And then I think also too, at that time that it just really, I think it sort of added on to my love for like Elvira mm -hmm. because I, I got it then because then it was like, it was kind of like that movie gave me context for what that type of person in this like world actually means and what they're doing um, and the things that they can sort of face. So yeah, uh, Fright Night was huge. Um, amazing effects, wonderful soundtrack. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a favorite. And you would never get Terror Vision without it. So <laughs> another <laughs> no, good another good host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and you keep, I do have to say, um, because both of you I know are from the Chicago area and you've both mentioned Spengoolie. This is another thing that I've discovered with 80s kids is you can immediately tell what area of their country they're from by which horror host they watch. Mm -hmm. Like mine was Count Gore Vidal because we were in between DC and Richmond. So we got Count Gore Vidal out of DC and Bowman Body out of Richmond. Um, and so like somewhere we got both of them. And so, yeah, but like, I'll hear other people be like, oh no, I got blank. And I'm like, oh, oh, you're Seattle. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's like, if you know your horror host, you can immediately figure out where they are in the world. And, how and I immediately, I was gonna say, I immediately get sad for anybody who didn't get to grow up with a horror host. Yeah. Like did, that to I, me is a bummer. Yeah. Those, even those curated, like even thinking like a USA up all night, there was so that curated weekly viewing, um, which we have a little bit now with the new Joe Bob Briggs, but like there was so much stuff that popped up on USA up all night that I never would have watched on my own. But because, you know, Rhonda Shear is like bouncing around to it, I was suddenly like, okay, well, I'm going to watch this for the next three hours. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Okay. So that takes me to Leviathan from 1989. <laughs> So it was just a guarantee I put at least one aquatic horror on this list. And then I was like looking, okay, well, I've got um, from that year, Deep Rising, The Abyss, and Leviathan. And Leviathan is by far my fave. So if I think kind of what one of my biggest movie, like uh, in general kind of uh, movies that informed me would be Piranha, um, which is from the late seventies or else it would be on this list. But that movie just, it looks like the house I grew up in we, on a river. We were on the Shenandoah river. Um, and so I was consistently scared to death, but yet in love with everything underwater and how kind of weird everything is. I was like obsessed with leeches and um, just, it was a really weird fucking kid. Um, and so, yeah, then going from that to seeing Leviathan where it is this level of weird body transformation it's body horror and the creatures are weird and everything's about just morphing and um just changing consistently and the thing where she looks down at her arm and she sees these little tiny worms like circling back and forth inside of her broke open flesh fucking just freaked the shit out of me but I could have watched that shot for another 10 minutes staring at it um um, and that weird kind of level of fascination repulsion I found in Leviathan. I love this movie so much. I don't know if it makes sense. I don't know if it's the most cohesive plot. I don't know. There's something in the vodka that made us all start morphing. And then we all became one giant monster. And then at the end, we threw a flamethrower into its mouth. Whatever. I don't care. That giant leech thing that DeJesus got on his chest fucking kicked ass. And I'm in for every minute. Well, if we had extended this to sci-fi, also Robocop would probably make a bunch of our lists. So <laughs> so it's good that Peter Weller's making this He's list. In here. I appreciate He's in that. Here. Yeah. Uh, my next one is a movie I forgot. Oh, it's The Blob. Uh, the Chuck Russell remake nice. of The Blob. Still one of my favorites to this day and a movie that, again, I sort of imprinted on at a very early age, watching it on VHS as soon as it came out. Um, it's a movie that made me like very aware of special effects in a way I hadn't been before uh, because I couldn't figure out how they did so much of it. And now having listened to your guys interview with Tony Gardner, I know how they did a lot of it. I still can't, I still can't uh, visualize I can it. read about it in the book <laughs> that Heather wrote. So there's yeah. lots of places I could go to find out how Tony Gardner did it. Um, but also, I, you know, I had said about Night of the Creeps that, like, I didn't know movies could do that. Um, the Blob was one of those movies that, like, oh, I didn't know you could kill a kid. Like, uh, how is that okay? And it's a movie that I became very protective over. It became 
mine in this way that was like part of my identity and I would want to show it to other people. So anytime we would get together, like for a sleepover to watch a movie, I would always be like, you guys got to check out the blob. Uh, and I turned a lot of people on to the blob. Hopefully uh, I'm leaving my mark on the world. That's that was one of my favorite feelings is of that time is, is the sharing movie. I mean, might be why we still do this stuff like podcasting and writing books and, you know, for sure. The sharing. Um, my next one, very simple, uh, and I'm sure everyone had different relationships, even though the second might be more entertaining now. When I saw The Evil Dead, or Evil Dead, uh, I did not... It was the first time I realized you could make a movie. And I, I, I'd seen a sh- some Polish short films once, like one by Polanski, where I suddenly was like, oh, they're making this with their hands. I get it, because you would see the edges. Evil Dead was the first feature where I was like, wait, this is, you can tell they're just doing this somehow with a little camera and just, and I loved it as well. It was like instantly one of my favorite movies in that moment and still scary, you know, the trees and just stuff that was quite disturbing, but I just, and the crazy camera work. So this one instantly inspired multiple short films that we made, you know, straight away with somebody's uh, like handy cam. I can't remember what it was, but like, there's a whole bunch of movies. They're just straight Raimi rips that we made when we're super young, me and my friend Alex. And uh, and then right after, I'd almost have to double and do a cheat here because right after I saw Bad Taste and being where we were, that was the first time I realized, oh, not only can you make this kind of movie, but you can do it right here where we are. And so those two movies back to back were like, oh, this is crazy. Let's just do that. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I, I've evolved mentally at all, but those two made a big impact uh, at the moment. And they're definitely responsible for me seeing behind the curtain that these weren't just things to be consumed, but you could inspire you to want to do it. And that's what, you know, and then, and then once you read up about him and learn he's 21 or whatever, you're like blew my mind and became the biggest, you know, huge Bruce Campbell fan when I was young and just yeah, all that stuff. So evil dead. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> um, yes. I think my final one, um, again, growing up in the eighties, I didn't kind of know what indie horror was, mm-hmm. but I knew when I watched this next movie that it was something really different. Um, And I think it imprinted on me in a very specific way where I suddenly had an appetite for things that just were really out of the box ways of approaching stories. Uh, And that was Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark. Um, Because growing up, as I said, I was obsessed with vampires. Uh, After Lost Boys, I started a vampire hunting club. Um, I have a vamp poster in my dining room. Like, oh yeah, you should vamp at jump, oh, jump cut. I remember you brought vamp. I did. Yeah. You know, that you was know great. And I show vamp at that catastrophic. Dee Pfeiffer was there. Dee Dee Pfeiffer <laughs> was there. I know. I was. Um, so yeah. So for me, Near Dark was something really different because I just I, all I knew was a vampire movie. Um, even though they never say vampires in the movie, um, but it was it was like a complete one eighty. From anything else I had seen throughout that decade, I mean, I think the closest thing that came to it was The Hitcher, but it shares the writer, Eric Red. Um, so there was something very just completely against the grain about the way he approached stories. And it made me really fall in love with sort of this new, that you could take things that were really familiar and were the trend and come at it from a completely different perspective. Um, you know, because if you look at the variety of vampire movies we had in the 80s, we were getting all kinds of different things. It wasn't just trying to redo Dracula over and over and over again. Um, and so for me, Near Dark was that. It just, it felt unsafe. It felt really rough, but like not in an amateur way, just in a I'm living it kind of way. Um, and just the performances were fantastic. The score, like just the way that like breath would hang in the air. And those night shots, like, I can see it. Like, I can close my eyes right now and I can see that. Um, And that was just such a huge huge movie for me. And then I remember, like, a few years later, Blue Steel came out. And I was like, wait, that's the lady who did Near Dark. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And so that was like, it really, that was when I was starting to put directors and things together. And I was like, oh, wow, this, this lady comes at things very differently when she takes on very familiar types of stories. So that was like the beginning of my uh, lifelong love and appreciation of Catherine Bigelow. Um, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. I, I'm, I, I will never complain about the stupid Twilight-esque art on the Blu-ray that came out in 2009 because I at least own it. Um, and that artwork can't take away from it. 
So for everybody who was bitching and moaning then, they're like, I love this artwork. And I was like, yeah, don't buy it. That's fine because now it's out of print and everybody has to wait every six months for Shutter to get it so you can watch it again <laughs> and then it goes away. So, you know. Do you think we could ever I'll get another another horror film from Catherine Bigelow or very unlikely? God, I wish. I'd love to see her in the I genre. Wish. Yeah. I feel like at this point, probably not. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know why, like how somebody wins Oscars. Yeah, it's the weirdest. Still, make movies. Like, doesn't just have that door open for them. Years in between um, each film. Yeah, it's really, yeah. it's really strange. It's well, maybe she's just really picky. I'm probably deluding myself here, but I like to think that she's just continuously reading scripts and like, like 30 a week. And she's just not, no, this one's not right. Not right. Not right. I hope, I hope she's doing that. I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like, you know, she made point break. If they're not going to be at least point break worthy, like why, why, why bother? Yeah. 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 Oh, I wish one day. Come back to us, Catherine. Come back. <laughs> I, I would love it. Okay. So I decided to end my list with the one that carried me into the 90s that kind of made me the teen I would become. And that would be They Live. Because when I look at like, um, usually when people are thinking about like the punk rock movies in the 1980s, it's like Class of 84 and um, like Return of the Living Dead. But I always look at They Live as one of the most punk rock movies of the 1980s. I watched this um, with my parents, probably 1989. I was probably in fifth grade and just thought it was cool because aliens with no face. And then it wasn't until a couple of years later that it, and when I was going into high school, that I realized that it's basically like if Rage Against the Machine was a movie, this is that movie. And then it became everything for me. And this movie was such a huge part of my angsty, despondent teen years. Um, you know, religion is false. Money is evil. Corporate America is trying to enslave you with like Ronald McDonald and you're a narc. And that was like <laughs> everything that I was when I was a teen was just rebelling against it. And I, this ended up being like my go-to, like I'd be on dates and they'd be like, you want to read liner notes of like pretty hate machine. And I'd be like, yeah, but have you seen they live? Like, this is the one I would always pull out on like my angsty teen dates and show people. Um, and so I've only slightly gotten out of that face slightly. Um, I think it sticks with you. I, I basically would still shop at Hot Topic every chance I get if I could. Um, so yeah, but this this is the movie that carried me into what I was by the time I was 16 and became the movie that I 16 year old me would have held up as like, this is what I believe in. And there it is. I can't believe dates made you read the liner notes of Pretty Hate Machine. I'm sure they did. And I'm sure I was like, do you go on, Robert. This is amazing. Oh, you're so What's... dreamy. You're probably in a graveyard. What... It was wild. What's terrible is I think in, in my teen dating experience, I was the reverse. I think I was the one showing liner liner notes, but I think it was Nine Inch Nails and probably you too also. Oh, nice. <sighs> Becca, did, Sorry. did any of your dates think the fight was too long? No, no, that fight is have, not too I want to have one of the dates go, this is a little long. Protracted. This fight seems to be going on for a little I don't long understand. We're done. We're done here. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, sir. You can go. <laughs> My way into They Live wasn't even John Carpenter because I didn't know, I didn't put it together who John Carpenter yeah. was at the time. My way in was Roddy Piper yeah. because he was my favorite nice. wrestler. And I was like, he made a movie? And so that's why I saw They Live. Uh, my number five. Uh, by the end of the 80s, I was consuming so much horror that I won't say I'd grown numb to it, but it I wasn't watching it because it scared me. There's a lot of reasons why I love horror movies. Being scared isn't in the top 10 reasons. And yet, to this day, I struggle with Pet Cemetery because it's not even the movie. It's fucking Zelda. It's like there's <laughs> the movie... And then every once in a while, we stop to tell a story about a sister who's bedridden and sick and twists her own neck around. And she's the scariest fucking thing. I used to have to walk through my mom's room to, like, put clothes in the hamper. And I would have to run back out because I was positive Zelda was going to pop up on the bed, just like she does in the movie. Um, I've gotten better about keeping my eyes open during the Zelda scenes when I watch Pet Cemetery now. But it still really bothers me. Like, it's still that thing. It's it's cockroaches for Heather or whatever. It's like this one thing that scares you as a kid, you can't quite get over. Um, 
you have that almost that automatic nerve response where you're just like, oh, I'm still kind of scared of this. And for me, it's Zelda and Pet Cemetery. So Zelda, Pet Cemetery reminds me that horror movies still have the power to scare me. You know, a couple of, I think it was at Trivia last month, there was somebody, my daughter was with me, she's 11, and after Trivia, I was sitting around, I was talking to somebody, Jared, or might have been Collins, and we were talking about the Zelda scene, and Marnie was immediately like, oh, can I see that? Because we were talking about how messed up and scary it is, and Marnie was immediately like, can I see that scene? And for the first, I've never told her she can't watch a horror film in any capacity. I just generally do not, I, I encourage it, if anything. And immediately, I was like, no, no, you may not. We'll talk when you're 16. You may That's not good. watch that scene, young lady. Let her have a childhood. That's good. I've never said that before. Like, we don't, you know, know on the sexual content, but for me to say something, no to something that is just scary, I was like, no, you're not seeing it. We'll talk later. Maybe when you're married. <laughs> just show her part two. Jump right in. <laughs> Who's the big fan of that? Is that Joe Bigas? Somebody, it's their favorite movie of all. I don't, I, I can never remember, but it's, it's Joe okay. Bigas. Yeah. That's a wild, a wild pick. <laughs> Um, yeah, like similar to Heather uh, in terms of like a visceral reaction. I've, I've told this before, but I'm I have a movie that literally just made me one movie uh, changed me on a chemical level. And I'm not just saying that I, I've never had this experience again on television. I'm eight years old. The Shining came on TV, didn't know what it was. And I was just so hypnotized. And it and it's still the movie that has had the most impact on me to this day. It's the movie I think about the most. It's my favorite movie and it just i've never experienced something like that of being like of course i didn't know their tracking shots but like just being pulled down corridors and when we uh, becca was talking about repulsion and attraction being eight and you're still not fully formed uh, in terms of your sexual things but then the woman in the bathtub knowing that that was exciting and then she turns into this like you know scary thing like all these things just had this quality that i've never never had another screening of my life like this and i remember it so well because i was watching it it came on with commercials it's on tv and the next day i went to school and was just telling everyone about how this changed my life and i will never forget my my best friend alex who i just recorded a podcast with for the first time uh i remember telling him and he goes yeah i started too yeah it sucked or or being very underwhelmed and i couldn't believe it now it's his favorite movie of all time so at the time though i like to remind him that i was like super excited about this movie that they're all like eh, we didn't like it and i don't know it's so it's so weird when a, that a movie has that kind of um cinematic quality and obviously so much of the filmmaking and style now is what we think of as contemporary i think this film is almost the defining if we're talking about a24 and and yeah. ariaster and things like that this is probably one of the true benchmarks of that aesthetic too so anyway this movie just it just blew my little head open and made me just want to make not evil dead type movies but something that's even more measured but uh love it well i'm glad we all i mean i think it's interesting that no one took because the thing that i spent the most time in this decade watching were the friday the 13th movies but it's but they it's like it's no individual one made me they all just you know or had an impact like number three was the first one but I always view them like candy bars. Like while I'm in it, I'm like really into it. But then as soon as I walk away, it, it's nothing that I, it feels very ephemeral if that, but I love them. Oh, I but love, it them. Always, love watching them. They're I always felt yeah. so ephemeral to me. It wasn't something that I was like, I, this changed the soul of my being. I'm sure that there are people out oh, there. Yeah. Cause I know that some people had that effect with Halloween, which was another, except for Halloween three, which did change the soul of my being. But that was another one where I was like, I don't know if any of them changed the fabric of my being, but I know people who had that experience. Well, the cool thing about the 80s is we didn't necessarily watch these things in order. And I do think that's fun. Like, obviously, a couple of us did watch Nightmare 1 first, and it made a big impression. Do you guys remember your first Friday, just out of interest? I think mine was three, but. Mine was four. Okay, interesting. Five. And it was oh, on God. USA <laughs> up all night. Yeah, it was the telekinesis girl. Because oh, I remember yeah, yeah. the very oh, first. It was yeah, party that's, horn. That's seven. Oh, that's six. It's seven. That's seven. seven. Yeah, because five so, yeah, done all Jason. Had, yeah. Those had never been ones that I was really gravitating to renting. Like I always wanted the weird stuff. Like I would have written rented Night Beast over that. Um, because it, it was weird. And uh, so the first one I saw, Seven, yeah, it was the telekinesis girl who, and there's a girl who gets a party horn shoved in her eye. And yeah, like that was, that was my first one on USA Up All Night. I'll do it. What about you, Pat? Mine might've been three as yeah. well. That's the one I have the strongest memories of that I like associate with childhood. It's the biggest arc of my life is going from not liking Shelly to loving Shelly. Like when He's I was a kid, I didn't Shelley. like Shelly, but now I love Shelly. Shelly's my lawyer. I, I love, love Shelly. I love Larry now, but when I was I young, love, I didn't. I, lo I love Larry in real life, but I, great. oh gosh. But he brought I us the mask, Heather. He brought the mask. Shelley. I would be team Shelly if he didn't 
call her a bitch. That one girl a bitch. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the moment where it's from, like for weekend at Bernie's. Off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you guys, yeah. thank you for staying up late. Especially thank you guys the so lateness. much. Pat, this was really fun. Uh, what should people do who want the book right now? The last couple hundred copies. What will they do? Where should they go? Uh, you can go to aminkpublishing.com. Do I have that right, Heather? Yes. Or should they okay. just go to your Twitter uh, and look for a link? They could do that too. Uh, they could. Uh, I'm sure there's like a pinned tweet that's on there, or they can come to the signing at Dark Delicacies if you're local to the LA area on April 27th. And Are you coming out for this, Pat? I am. Hell yeah! But there might not and be copies a... by then. Well, no, the no, we're, we're saving aside. copies. Um, yeah, oh. we're set. We cool. set. We set like 50 aside for Dells, but I will say that they're getting really close, and theirs too. Okay. So yeah, yeah. and there's going to be special guests from. 80s horror Ooh. it's not just me and heather Ooh. yeah no um yeah we have um as far as confirmed yes as we have joe dante tom holland fx legend steve johnson uh two of the kyotos possibly three kyotos uh and the iconic kelly maroney and we have a few soft yeses as well um that i will be hopefully confirming in early april very cool well, thank you guys for spending this time with us. And we're really glad, yeah. you know, it was so fun flicking through it too. And, uh, and we'll see you back for the nineties edition. Yes. <laughs> oh, where gosh. can people find your guys show? <laughs> oh, our, uh, the yeah, show yeah. that Heather and I do together yeah. is called hanging with Toby Hooper and you can find it in, uh, in wherever you listen to your podcast. <laughs> we did a whole show on Wes Craven called Craven Craven. We went through all his yeah. movies and now we're on to Toby Hooper. Yeah, that's nice. nice stuff. Oh my god. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. We will be back in another two weeks. I work. Do we even know what we're doing in two weeks? No, oh, no. I do. We have a really cool guest, um, a Canadian filmmaker we have always wanted to chat with. Um, will be joining us for the show. He looks just fucking perplexed. I'm not even going to be tell the person him. who made the pit, or I'm going to be so upset. It's David I'm not Cronenberg. even. I'm not <laughs> even going to tell Elric. I'm just going to show up. He'll just pop. He's up a on podcaster. Cronenberg's a pod. Remember that one movie? Please oh, yeah. rate and please rate, rate and, and like. like. Um, and you can gun. always find us over at our Patreon show, Deep Cuts, where we have lots of amazing, weird stuff posting up. Um, so thank you all so much, and we will be seeing you soon. The Colors of the Dark podcast is a Fangoria production. Producers and co-hosts are Rebecca McKendry and Elric Kane. Executive producers are Tara Ainsley and Abby Gould. Sonic branding by Michael Rodriguez. And, of course, our amazing sound engineer, Ernie Hurtado. 